машина. Good evening. We are reconvening for a business session of the public meeting of Salem Kaiser School Board. Today is Tuesday, June 15th. Board meeting was called to order today at 5 p.m. with the board going directly into executive session under ORS 192.6602D to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations and ORS 192.6602E to conduct deliberations with persons designated to negotiate real property transactions. This executive session was announced in advance uh, on Friday, June 11, 2021, both by listing it in the agenda and posting it online. Executive sessions are not open to the public. It's now ten, eight minutes, uh, nine minutes past six, and we are reconvening for a meeting with the public session, which is our regular business meeting. Tonight's meeting is a hybrid meeting with most of our board members in person. And no, all the board members in person, student advisor is also in person, no one is online. Public access is online only. Only board members and designated staffs are in the boardroom. I look around and all of you are here, all the board members are present. I'm going to uh, request uh, Director Jesse Lepold Pion to read the land acknowledgement, please. Go ahead. So uh, before I read the land, land acknowledgement, it is important to understand that the land acknowledgement means nothing if we are not truly serving, honoring, and respecting Native people in our own lives. As the first and only Native American to ever serve on the Salem Kaiser School Board, it has been eye-opening to see the lack of Native American voice in the world of education. Uh, there have been personal experiences as a community, community leader, and from many stories I've heard from other Native families across our community, where they feel like our culture and our people are ignored, judged, and erased. If our goal is to make all students feel safe and welcome, then it's important for us to change this. It's also important to recognize that our Native students are struggling. Our Native students have the lowest graduation rates, some of the lowest attendance rates, and in the recent district survey, said that we don't feel like we belong. So you can throw stones at me all you want, you can blame the parents, you can blame the kids, but the facts remain the same. We have to change the way that we treat Native people or we will continue to get the same results. I'm going to keep fighting for my people and all BIPOC folks, but if we want to truly make a difference, then we need to change the culture, which means we need to change our hearts. I, I say this because when we read a land acknowledgement at any and all public events, but at the same time, we aren't backing it up with any actions to help our Native kids, and some even take direct actions to silence Native people, then it comes across as pandering and it loses all of its meaning. So I'm gonna read this acknowledgement, and all I ask is that you begin to reflect and think about how you are interacting with Native Americans, so that way we can show my people that these land acknowledgements actually mean something and carry the weight and gravity that they deserve. So acknowledgement is critical in building the necessary trust to coexist in harmony with one another. Indigenous tribes and bands have been apparent on the lands of the Willamette Valley, across Oregon, and throughout the Americas since time immemorial. In this valley, the ancestry of the Kalapuya reaches the furthest back in time, reminding us that this plentiful place has been called by home by its original inhabitants, Maya ancestors, long before the name of the snowy peaks and the bountiful waters were re-identified. Today we acknowledge that the people of this land still exist and inhabit this valley not as heirs to it or as artifacts, but as reciprocal contributors to the modern society we live in. We forward our respect to my people, the first peoples of this land, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon, and those who have ceded lands here. We reflect on the displacement, removal, and genocide of indigenous people that occurred throughout Oregon and beyond. In so doing, we truly honor the gravity of the past and endeavor to see that people may live in harmony and equity on this land for posterity. May this acknowledgement carry renaissance as a tool of peace over the land and waters we mutually rely upon. Please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Director Lepolpion. Uh, will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd like to make a, a, a slight agenda modification and propose, uh, and then maybe we can follow it up with a little discussion on that. So the, you can't, yeah, she can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I would like to make an agenda modification and would like to propose that our Salem Kaiser School Board consider a designated First Amendment space in a location uh, within this uh, property or wherever the board meeting is held and designate a no trespass zone in, in the periphery of this building and the glass so that the meetings can be held in such a way that the public can listen to it. Because one of the important uh, requirement of a public meeting is for public to listen to the deliberations. The second thing is a safety concern with the glass and we have people banging on the glass and that can cause some damage or hurt them. So let's, I would like to make this as a proposal and, uh, and see what the board has to say. Let's kind of open it up for discussion. Wait, excuse me, can we get clarification from Mr. DeCopolis on this resolution? So the resolution would be in two parts. Number one, to establish a free speech zone in the parking lot of this building um, for the public uh, to uh, engage in free speech. But the second part of the resolution would be to authorize the district, to authorize, authorize the district security department uh, to enforce a no trespass zone around the perimeter of this building so that the public cannot disrupt the, the business of the board. Uh, disrupting the business of the board is a violation of the public meeting law. Um, and you would do the same thing if, if this kind of disruption happened inside the boardroom. Uh, and so you'd be authorizing the security department to enforce a, a no trespass zone so that the meeting would not be disrupted in the way it's being disrupted right now. Any discussion on this? I don't think I heard any of that. Yeah. You did not hear anything? Do you mind repeating it, uh, Mr. Dekop? I, I don't know that it'll help. I don't, I don't think it's, it's, I'm sorry. Let's but, hear from Mr. Dekopoulos because uh, Dr. Lepol Pion did hear. He, I don't think it'll help. Yeah, it won't be able to help. Would you? We don't have to do that. Yeah. Well, ex we don't have to approach the dais with a mic so you can hear them. Yep. We still need you to be on the microphone. Yeah. Sorry. The idea for this resolution is to, uh, is to establish a free speech zone outside this building uh, for the public to uh, engage in free speech uh, during um, board meetings. Uh, the second part of the resolution would be to authorize the district security department to enforce a no trespass zone after appropriate notification to the public um, on board meeting nights so that the uh, public cannot disrupt um, at, uh, the, the, the public meetings of the board. Uh, you have the power to enforce decorum in your boardroom uh, and you would not allow this kind of behavior to disrupt board business and disrupt the public's ability to 
hear board business. Um, and so the same resolution would apply, the same idea would apply to the perimeter of this building. It would not restrict in any manner the speech, but it would restrict people from trying to uh, disrupt the meeting by beating on windows and doors. We'll open it up for discussion. Any discussion on this? Uh, Director Lepolpion. Uh, sure. So I have two questions, I guess. One, the first is um, as far as public comment goes, right? Because that would be the one concern is would, would there be any concerns as to would this no trespass thing affect in any way uh, the amount of public comment we're getting or make people feel like they cannot come give feedback? This resolution has nothing, has no effect on public comment. What it does have an effect on is standing close to the building and beating on the wall with, um, with hands or, or objects, um, which completely disrupts the, the meeting. So it, it doesn't have any effect on speech. It just has an effect on disruptive <laughs> behavior right next to the perimeter of the building. And then would that include things like air horns or like loud music or what, what's the, the, the line? All we can enforce is our, our own property and, and so for uh, the, the sidewalks are not uh, district property. So uh, there can be disruptive behavior um, of, on, on uh, sidewalks, um, city sidewalks, but uh, you, you can enforce um, this kind of uh, a zone for uh, for the perimeter of this building or any building that the board is conducting its business in, if the goal is to make sure you can conduct business and the public can participate. Thank you. Any other questions on this topic, Director Blasi? Do you have Vice Chair Bethel, Director Kylo? I'm thinking. Director Goss. You want to use the mic, please? Thank you. Um, I guess I can't help but feel we're pandering to poor behavior by establishing a different spot for poor behavior out in our parking lot. And then the next step, we're worried about cars in our parking lot and that sort of thing. If I would vote for it around the building, but I wouldn't vote for replacing it with something that's going to continue to cause us problems. Okay. Any other discussion, and then we can save the answers from uh, Mr. Dakopoulos. Who else raised a hand next? I missed. Director Hyen, did you raise? Director, advice of Mebinton. Um, what is the appropriate notification that? Well, the, the notification w would occur after the board meeting um, where the, the district would have to, to publish um, the resolution and notify the public that this is going to be the plan. It wouldn't be effective tonight, um, but it would be effective in the future. And, and uh, I don't know all the ways that the district could reach out to the community to say, we're trying to create a safe space for speech but we can't have people uh, who routinely disrupt the meeting so no one can hear. Uh, Advisor Mabinton, you know, we do send notices for the school board meeting on Fridays. So there is a mechanism we have to let the community know about it. I have seen similar uh, free speech zone established around capital and farmer's market and different places. They do have designated free speech. We have to provide, at least in my opinion, we have to provide a free speech zone where people can, they do have a fundamental right to protest. And I'm not in support of taking away that right, which is different from the potential risks. I had actually sought a legal opinion from Mr. DeCopolis some time ago. What are the glass breaks and a little child or a, a adult ends up getting seriously injured, or the, ch the glass breaks in the passion of emotion, they come inside, 
And then we are talking about potential legal uh, risks and so many other risks of uh, uh, coming in the middle. So these are some very important uh, questions that I'm glad we are discussing. And I have another question. So if they do want to protest. Push your button. Oh, sorry. You. If they do want to protest, mm -hmm. um, where, where, where would they go? Well, under the, the, under the current um, discussion, the, the idea would be that the parking lot of this building would be available for that purpose, but not the sidewalk that leads into the, the, this, this front set of windows, uh, nor the flower bed that has been trampled um, on the east side of, of the building. So the perimeter would be off limits so people don't beat on the windows so loud that the board can't conduct its business. Um, and and that, that, that's the basic idea. I also have some safety concerns. When the doorways and exits are all duct taped, and you know, it really poses uh, safety concerns of egress or you know, potentially barricading the occupants inside. So I really think these are all serious matters. We have to kind of discuss it openly and say, how do we balance the ability to protest First Amendment versus safety? Go ahead, uh, Mr. Wolf, and then we'll go to director. Thank Hi. you, uh, Chair uh, Chandra Giri. I would also say that we will go through a thorough risk assessment mm -hmm. and determine the best location mm -hmm. so that it's least disruptive but still honors the uh, free speech. So I can't tell you that it's going to be right here, but I can say that we'll do our due diligence and make sure that we've got it in an appropriate space. Uh, director Hyatt? What's that about duct tape? They're duct taping the doors? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Last time the, the door handles were duct taped so people couldn't get out, as I understand it. We have reached out and um, we're assured that they wouldn't do that again. So we have reached out on that. So, so there are, so you know, these are really important because we need to ensure the egress is maintained. Mm -hmm. There are some safety codes we have to make, at least I, the way I understand it has to be maintained. Yet we need to balance it with the ability to protest. Everything sounds fair, 100%. Um, my only concern is what Director Gross said. Um, if it would be removing them for the, from the parking lot, it, like off of this whole property, then I feel like that would be going into a little bit of taking away the right to protest. Um, but also, that's where I feel like maybe the issue would come in. Um, not being around the building, but in the parking lot. That might be another safety hazard. Well, you know, those are things I'm going to ask Mr. Wolf to kind of come up with a risk assessment mm -hmm. and identify a properly designated, you know, nicely covered area, which can be, they can use it for all weather protest. That way it is safe. <laughs> and, you know, it's really important to provide that ability to protest. That's protected in our First Amendment. Yeah. I love that. Are we ready to move ahead with the vote? Yeah. So I really think this is a serious matter. And I really would like to know if we can go ahead and take a vote on this so that we can start conducting the public meeting and respect the public meeting law so the public can hear what we are discussing. I mean, they are not able to come in. At least they should be able to listen and hear. Let me then restate this again since it's quiet. Um, the, the, the motion would be um, in two parts. Number one, to establish a free, s for the district to establish a free speech zone um, in this location um, of, uh, or any location in which the board is meeting. And two, um, to authorize the district um, through its security uh, department uh, to establish a no trespass zone directly around the perimeter of the building uh, in order to um, allow the board to have, uh, to be able to conduct public meetings uh, without uh, interference and disruption. And it would only apply to the perimeter of a building in which the board is having a board meeting. That's it. Is there anybody like to move that motion or second? Is it open? 
I have a question. Go I ahead. don't understand why uh, they can't be trespassed now. They can move to the sidewalk. That is their legal right. But if they're on this property and potentially breaking glass and causing disruption, I'm just confused as to why they cannot be trespassed now. They can be asked to leave. And if they don't leave, then you call the police and trespass them. Okay, Mr. Dacopoulos, would you like to answer? Well, probably the best way to answer that is there's some history of allowing this as a board uh, in past board meetings. And so simply making the decision tonight with no notice to anyone um, uh, uh, will be, um, might be problematic uh, both for this board and for the, the students who have come to expect that they can do this. Yeah. And there needs to be a, discuss a public discussion about how disruptive this is and where is, a, where is an appropriate place to protest. But the board still has to conduct the, the business mm -hmm. of the district. Um, and so the, the thought was simply ordering this tonight with no notice um, uh, may be unfair or too surprising. Thank you, Mr. Dacopoulos. That, uh, no. Any other discussion before we kind of, yeah. I'd just like to add that in the event that tonight we, we progress through this agenda and we're unable to provide equal access to the public because of any distractions, we can vote to terminate the board meeting mm -hmm. and postpone it for a later date. We're statutorily required, we're, by law, we're required to allow the, the public to engage. And if they cannot hear us because they're on virtual land, then we have the responsibility to, to postpone. And I'm prepared to do that because we have a lot of really great things that the public needs to engage in tonight on this agenda. And hopefully we're allowed to do that. But just so you know, if it gets to that point, then I'll be making a motion to terminate the meeting. Yeah. Uh, just to add to what Vice Chair Bethel says, now this is really important for me. Today, we are going to pass the resolution on LGBTQ+. This is really important. Last month, we really focused on Asian American and Pacific Islander. And I really think, as a, I would like to embrace and really walk the walk of having diversity and inclusion of different communities. And it really is important to honor when we read the land acknowledgement for the community to hear and really understand the sacredness of this document. It is not, as Director Lepol Pions rightly said, it is really, it's a sacred. So we need to allow that. And for that, we need to be able to conduct the board business in such a way that the public can also not just see, but understand and participate here. So we have to take a decision so that we can proceed. Plus, we have some very important agenda today. OK. So is there a motion to approve this? I make the motion to approve this resolution. Is there anybody who is? As presented by Mr. Dacopoulos. Yep. I'll second. OK. Any discussion on this? Uh, Director Glassy? We just call for the vote. We had discussion. Yep. All right, we'll call for the vote. Yes, sir. Before we call for the vote, I do have some discussion. Please. And I guess that it centers around the fact that I won't be here anymore, so I'm really not too worried about what I have to say. But I have to be direct in that we ask to have this stopped earlier. We ask to have the phoning that we dealt with at every meeting stopped. And now we've gone still full circle, and now we've come up with a plan to stop the phoning, and I agree with that. But now it's like a slap in the face to be told, well, you didn't act soon enough. Well, I can't buy that, Paul. I would have appreciated some resolution earlier, so we haven't set through all this. But. That's all I have to say. I will be voting no on the motion. Okay. Any other discussion? I think we'll take a vote now. We have had a discussion. So let's start with Dr. Hyen. How do you vote? Yes. Dr. Lepol Pion? Yes. Dr. Goss? No. Dr. Kylo? No. Vice Chair Beto? Yes. 
Director Blasi? Yes. I'll be voting yes. So we had two no's, Director Goss and Director Kylo, and we had all others voted yes. So the motion passes. We should never yes. have seated me next to you down here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now let's proceed with uh, the spotlight. Superintendent Perry. All right, uh, we have a number of uh, spotlights tonight, and the first one is going to be presented by Bob Silva, our Director of Technology and Information Services. Mr. Silva, Director Silva. Superintendent Perry, will you let me know when you'd like me to share a screen? Okay. Yeah. Do we have somebody on? On the, on the Zoom for this? Okay. Good evening, Chair Sean Nagiri, Superintendent Perry, and Board Directors. It is my pleasure to present the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools June 2021 Community Partner of the Month, Performance Health, PH Tech Providence. Last fall, PH Tech slash Providence donated $120,000 to Salem-Kaiser Public Schools, which provided internet access to nearly 2,000 families across our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic disproportionately affected students from low-income families and families who could not afford internet connectivity. As SKPS schools transitioned to comprehensive distance learning, PH Tech reached out to the district with a goal to provide remote access to students and families who were greatly impacted financially. As a first-time partner, Salem-Kaiser expresses its deepest appreciation for PH Tech and its commitment to providing access to education. This financial contribution helped SKPS to ensure equity in technology and internet connectivity throughout distance learning. Thank you, PH Tech, for your generosity. And there they are. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Can we just have them introduce themselves quick since they? Sure, Drew and Andy. Could you yeah, introduce you yourself? Ahead. Yeah, um, I'm Andy Herman. I work for uh, PH Tech. I've been there for almost 10 years um, as a software developer. Uh, a while ago, um, I was a software developer at Salem Kaiser Public Schools, so uh, it's kind of a fun connection. Um, yeah, we're proud of the work that the technology department has done in doing the right thing and providing internet technology, internet, you know, uh, connectivity. And so it was easy for us to just come alongside and, and uh, provide some financial support. So good job. SKPS Tech. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Drew Bryan. I'm the AVP of Technology for PH Tech, and uh, echo what Andy said. I, you know, we we pride ourselves in being a presence in our community, and we all have families uh, in the community. And you know, as we all saw our own children go through this transition and everything, uh, understanding the impacts of distance learning on on the kids and also the teachers in our community, uh, this is something we we're really excited to be able to to, to help out with. So. Uh, thank, thank Bob and others for uh, connecting with us in this process and, and uh, helping make this happen. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thanks, guys. All right. Our next uh, spotlight is on Chad is from Chad Barks, the principal at Sprague High School. Hello, Principal Barks. Hey. Good evening, uh, Christy. Good evening, uh, Chair Chandigiri and Board Directors. Um, recently, Sprague High School and our teacher, Phil Rodin, was awarded the Oregon and Southwest Washington Computer Science Educator of the Year Award um, by the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. Phil won this award because he works to get more of our female students involved in computer science. He teaches all of our computer science cl classes at Sprague. This includes advanced placement, um, computer science, web design, and video production. Phil also works to give students real-world technology in his classroom. Uh, he runs our technology support program where students are on call to help both peers and um, our staff, which has happened often. He also works with two or three students each term, teaching them about website management. If you've ever gone on to the Sprague High School website, that is Phil's baby, along with our students who do the programming, work on the content, and while Phil will tell you it's not perfect, right, he allows for them to work on it and to make mistakes, it is real life. So thank you, Phil, for the opportunities you give students to learn technological skills. Um, we are very, very proud that you are a Sprague Olympian. Phil, 
Congratulations, and it's great to see you, even though it's across the screen. Thank you for all you do for our kids. All right, our next spotlight is going to be presented by Tara Romine, our assistant principal at South Salem High School. Good evening, uh, Mina, if you are here and able to turn on your camera, we'd love to see you. Um, Chair Chandra Geary, uh, Superintendent Perry, and Board Directors, South Salem High School 2021 graduate Mina Morris was recently named a 2021 Regional Affiliate winner of the Oregon and Southwest Washington Aspirations and Computing Award. This annual award, sponsored by the National Center for Women and Information Technology, honors women in grades 9 through 12 who are active and interested in computing and technology and encourages them to pursue their passions. Mina has worked as a technician for a ballistics testing laboratory and taught computer coding classes to youth in our community, specifically to female students. Lastly, she has excelled in a variety of STEM-related subjects, which include computer programming, CAD, drones, and manufacturing. Next year, Mina will attend college at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California, and she plans to study aerospace engineering. The National wow. Center for Women and Information Technology is a nonprofit group that brings together more than 11,100 organizations in an effort to increase the participation of girls and women in computing. It strives to reach girls and women of all communities, races, ethnicities, ages, sexual orientations, and disability statuses. This is especially important as women make up only 20% of the computer science professionals. Women from marginalized communities are even more underrepresented. As a regional winner, Mina gains access to mentors in the computing industry and chances for future internships and employment, as well as access to training in technology. Thank you, Mina, for leading the way and being a role model for other girls across our community, state, region, and beyond. The Saxons wish you all the best with the exciting future that lies ahead of you. Congratulations. Mina, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Romine. All right, our next um, spotlight is so going to be presented by Stephen Lytle, our coordinator of our music and drama programs. Mr. Lytle, I think he's got a big lineup of them. Good evening, Chair Chandagiri, Board Directors, and Superintendent Perry. The music department is thrilled to announce that the Salem Kaiser Public Schools is one of the recipients for the National Association of Music Merchants 2021 Award for Best Communities in Music Education. This national award program recognizes outstanding efforts by teachers, administrators, parents, students, and community leaders who make music education a successful part of a well rounded education. Designations are made to districts and schools that demonstrate an exceptionally high commitment and access to music education. The pandemic may have dramatically altered the music experience for Salem Kaiser teachers and students, but has not changed their desire to remain connected through music. The regular concerts, festivals, and rehearsals that we are accustomed to observing in a normal year were replaced with a majority of online experiences. Only recently have we gained the ability to meet in person and begin a return to a more normal experience. Salem Kaiser teachers have worked hard to provide students opportunities to demonstrate individual and group achievement and give outlets for students to showcase their talents. And it's with great delight and pride that we applaud our excellent music teachers and students for their outstanding accomplishments in this challenging year. Thank you. All right, I think that is it for our spotlights tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Perry. Yeah. Now we're going to turn to Ms. Uh, Sylvia McDaniel, the Director of Communications and Community Relationship Relations for the public comment section for agenda and non-agenda items. Ms. McDaniel, please. Thank you, Chair Shondagiri, Vice Chair Bethel, Superintendent Perry. 
we have one public comment for non-agenda item. Um, it's from uh, Gregory Anderson. It is against the contra critical race theory. Um, as a parent in the district, I would like the school board to ensure that critical race theory is not taught or promoted in Salem Kaiser. Teaching that my child is by nature oppressed because of her skin color, or that my neighbor's child should be ashamed of himself because of his actively trains the next generation to be racist. Additionally, critical race theory would be a huge setback to the stated purpose and noble work of the OSEAA. Please train and support teachers to navigate difficult conversations about race, but please reject the counterproductive false narrative promoted by CRT. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. McDaniel. Now I'm going to turn over this next section, Superintendent Perry, for the reports. All right. Um, so, uh, Dr. Udos and Top, you could go ahead and share the screen for us. I just wanted to do a quick uh, report on graduations. I know that a number of you had a chance to attend graduations, but I thought it might be great to see it in a little bit of its um, entirety. So, um, we're going backwards. As fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, I'm not doing anything right now. It's a little lag. There oh, there you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very tricky. All right. So, um, first of all, we had two uh, ceremonies. Can, can you go ahead and I, I need He's to. He's like worried to touch the button. Yeah. Uh, we had two uh, graduation ceremonies uh, that were done virtually our African American graduation celebration, where we recognized 72 of our yeah. graduates. Uh, the second one that we did virtually was our Pacific Islander um, celebration. And just huge shout out to uh, Cynthia's office for being sure that she put these on. And Lynette, did you get to watch yours yet? You did, awesome, yep. Um, and these are recorded as well, so we can send out uh, links to those. Um, we were able to have our Native American celebration in person, and we had uh, 44 of our, oops. I went one too many. Um, sorry. Uh, community transition program graduation was last Saturday. Um, both uh, Dr. Chandra Geary and Director Goss were there. And that's our favorite mm -hmm. <laughs> in so many ways. Um, and we had the best dance party of all time <laughs> on stage. So Johnny um, sang for us. And that was Friday at West. We had 44 students receiving their certificates. Okay, and then um, we also had our um, Native American uh, celebration, um, and I believe Dr. Lippold was at that one. And we had 44 program seniors that graduated, and 25 uh, nations were represented. So and we're thrilled to be able to do that one in person. Then we'll move on to, um, I think we're at McKay High School next. Um, 460 graduates. 42 right now, seals of biliteracy. And one thing I want you to note is that um, on the seals of biliteracy, many more of those come in over the summer. So I'll do a report in August for the total number. So for example, South, I think has um, like 20 some on the, on the list tonight, but by the end of the summer, they'll have 76. Mm -hmm. So we don't have all of those that have come yet in yet. And then uh, you can see both our valedictorians and our salutatorians for uh, McKay High School. Uh, one fun part about McKay is that families were able to be on the stadium field mm -hmm. and were able to, a few people walked across the stage uh, with their kids. And so it was um, kind of a fun atmosphere to be able to have the full family plus really close up video of students walking across the stage. Um, and then we have, um, next is McNary High School. And if you look at the large number of valedictorians at um, McNary High School, they were also at the Volcano Stadium this year and did several graduation ceremonies. Um, I think McKay did the most at 10 different graduation ceremonies mm -hmm. and the McNary had a number. And one of the questions we're gonna ask is what should persist beyond COVID? Um, because the smaller graduations are kind of nice. 
10's too many. Um, three was perfect, so we had the most students. Yeah, three is not bad. It was amazing. Three was good. Yeah. Yeah. And we had 504 kids. Right. So we did it, I think it took like 90 minutes for each mm -hmm. one, and it was awesome. Mm hmm. And it's just, they're just a little smaller. People, uh, people can bring uh, more family members. Uh, so that was really um, nice. The next one then is North Salem High School, where we have 381 graduates and 31 seals of biliteracy. Uh, Director Lippold was at that graduation. Um, there's our valedictorians and salutatorians. Um, I got uh, the privilege of giving not only Lynette her uh, diploma, but also Monse and Adrian at North Salem High School, who are part of our uh, student task force and our student equity teams. Uh, and I think North was the uh, school that got the rain. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had um, our robbers. <laughs> did <laughs> our, it rain there? It did rain there, yeah. It does, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, you got, okay, you got rain too. Um, Roberts High School, um, Early College High School Teen Parent Program. And I just want to do um, kind of a shout out to not only our completers, um, but um, also if you think about Roberts handing out 42 diplomas, these are kids who came in credit deficient, and the completion, what it takes to persist through a GED um, when you really um, are have been struggling in the schools, really um, something to really be thankful for. Uh, if you think about our teen parent program, these are um, graduates with babies, and um, so 16 of them got high school diplomas and four um, got GEDs. So I'm really proud of Roberts in the persistence on completion, and we don't give up on kids, that we keep them and keep completing, um, working to completion. Then we had, um, next is South Salem High School, 479 graduates. They got a little rain too, I'll say that. Uh, 20, <laughs> all at once, yeah, that was the rain storm. Uh, 20 uh, by literacy seals, 78 by the end of summer is our goal. Um, very, lots of um, valedictorians and salutatorians at South Salem as well. They had theirs on their uh, football field and um, was a great, another great um, event for us. And I think then we're at uh, Sprague is next, 364 graduates. Those are our valedictorians and salutatorians. And I think both Director Goss and Dr. Chandra Geary were there and got to, I think uh, Director Goss got to give her grandson his diploma, <laughs> which was super awesome. And then finally, uh, West Salem High School and West was um, at their, um, field as well. Those are our valedictorians um, and salutatorians from West. And then the great thing about West was they uh, kept their field. So we had a number of other ceremonies um, on their field as well. So a shout out to uh, West Salem for um, allowing us that opportunity. And I think uh, Director Goss was at um, West and Director Blasi was at um, South Salem. Uh, probably a, just a huge shout out to not only our seniors who made it in a tough year. If I could word cloud the words, Zoom in the graduation speeches and all of that. Zoom, Canvas, Grit, Resilience. And we use Grit, Resilience a lot, but I don't think those words can ever go in a graduation speech for years and decades to come because this was the hardest year. So this was a year that taught Grit and Resilience. So um, anyway, it was a great week, but a huge shout out to um, the high school teams that put these together and committed. The easier route <laughs> would have been to do something you know, more virtual, but they committed to those day-long celebrations where they were there the whole day and, uh, and uh, wanting to honor our kids. And I think that was really, really um, important in this year. It, uh, it was also awesome that um, we were able to take off face coverings because we were outside and we saw faces. And so I think that uh, just really rounded out a great uh, graduation season for us. We'll keep persisting with the kids that didn't make it across, quite across the finish line yet. And uh, we'll have the summer graduation in August for, at North Salem High School as well. So uh, if you uh, want to come see that, I'll get invites out, whether even if you're not still a CETA board member, if you're interested. All right, um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our key performance indicators report. 
And uh, we have um, Assistant Superintendent Cobb <laughs> at the microphone tonight to give our key performance indicators report. <coughs> Assistant Superintendent Cobb, how's Thank that sound? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds a little weird still, but still. <laughs> getting used to it. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Chandler Gary, board members, and Superintendent Perry. Today I'm going to give you an update on our key performance indicators. And as you recall, key performance indicators are high level checkpoints that we use throughout the year to uh, just see how our kids are doing um, academically in just in, and in all areas. Um, these are measures that just inform us about the vitality of our system and uh, we also uh, keep you informed. Let's see if this works. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. No, that's okay. I got it. Yes, the display card. <laughs> thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you. Thank They'll you. They'll get it. They'll be well choreographed. <laughs> thank you. Soon. We got yeah. it. Okay. Um, we went too far. There we go. Um, so remember the, keep, the KPIs not only monitor our academics but also the the system that um, we put in place to make sure that our students are successful. Um, you have been oriented to the Spark dashboard and that is a place where you have access to data so that you can see how our kids are performing. And you have also received reports on social, emotional, and behavioral health, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, our efforts for community engagement and empowerment. And today I'm going to uh, share with you a little bit about our academic success um, in areas around that. To get us started, I want to um, tell you about elementary attendance. And I want to give you um, uh, the snapshot, uh, a snapshot of two years, 2019 and then this year that we are finishing uh, this week. In 2019 and 2020, I want to remind us that we took attendance differently. We took attendance by counting and recording the students that were in seats and then we finished the year, the last two months and a half um, in distance learning. Um, in 1920, our attendance levels were above 92%, which is pretty healthy. And also we had a great consistency in attendance for the different student groups, um, about 91 to 95%, which is also um, a good number to be around. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we changed the way we uh, took attendance. We did it through different um, uh, modes. Um, um, just as a reminder, we recorded participation by maybe having a parent send us an email and saying my student did the task last night that you gave us, or a student turned in some work in one of the platforms that we offered uh, in virtual learning, or the parent or the student sent a text message and said, I finished with that assignment. So that's um, a, a way that we recorded attendance. Then we moved into limited in-person instruction. And as um, you know, we brought in uh, small groups of students uh, when it was safe uh, that needed additional supports. And we took attendance by counting their participation in schools. And uh, we finished the year uh, starting in March uh, in hybrid instruction, and that happened two days a week in person and two days a week um, at home learning. Um, we noticed that during hybrid, our students' um, attendance in person was pretty good. They were ready to see us, and we were ready to have them back. Um, but our uh, virtual um, learning days dropped in attendance. So overall, we saw a decrease in attendance in this past year, 2021. And then um, we are especially concerned about the drop in attendance for some of our students of color. And um, as we start planning for the fall and for summer engagement, we are especially interested in uh, working through some strategies to get them uh, back and start building stamina for five days a week um, engagement. Next. I want to share with you a little bit about our second grade reading and um, to um, just orient to, um, I want to just share a little bit about risk levels and why second grade. We target second grade because this is when students start making a transition from learning to read to reading to learn. So it's a pretty key um, um, uh, moment for us to know how our students are developing as readers. Um, then, um, to give you a picture of a second grader as a reader, 
Um, we want them to be able to read a short passage or a short story to um, give you main idea, to tell you um, key details of the story, and then give you some information about the characters in that story. When we, um, then we take data so that we can progress monitor and see how they're developing, and we talk about these risk levels. So let me help you, um, just guide you a little bit through these data. When we say that uh, our students are at low risk, that means that they are developing in a pretty solid way as readers, and they are meeting all of those um, targets that we have in the reading trajectory. When we say that our student is at some risk, it means that they need the core instruction that they receive as everyone else, and then maybe a small group or just additional targeted instruction to help them fill in for um, um, one of the foundational skills maybe that they need just a little bit of reinforcement for. When we say that a student is at high risk, that means that they are having a little bit more difficulty learning to read, and we need to layer on some support. So they will receive, for example, core instruction, then they will go into a small group, then they may also receive individualized instruction with the classroom teacher or with one of the specialists, and then they have additional practice that happens at school or at home. Um, um, for students in all of these areas, we are always doing progress monitoring in school so that we can make sure that what we are doing is helping them make adequate yearly progress. And then we modify and make changes to the plans if it's not. So um, going back to uh, the data that you have in front of you, we can see um, in the blue, col the blue um, um, columns, are the fall data and then the orange are the spring. To your left is the low risk. We want those numbers always in that column always to grow and we want the high risk column always to go down. Um, in this year, the, just the picture of the year, you can see how our students stayed at about 45% at the low risk category. And then for high risk, we were at about 26%. Something that I want to point out overall is that we didn't see huge drops even though we had a very challenging year with lots of transitions. So to us, this speaks to the efforts of teachers who did the best they could teaching uh, reading in virtual, just through that screen, and that's a very, very hard uh, thing to do. And they did an incredible job and even a better job when we had our kids in person and we were able to do that direct instruction and then um, modify instruction in the moment. So um, we are a ways to go. Of course, we want those numbers to be higher in the low risk category. But as I was putting together these data, I was curious about other years. So I look back at 1718 and 1819 and we ended in both of those years at the low risk, um, um, first year at 36% and second year at 37%. So even though we had this type of a year that we're coming out of, our kids were able to continue in their uh, trajectory as, reader, as readers in this grade level. And um, so I think that's something to point and celebrate. Okay, next I wanna go to secondary. And um, as you recall, for secondary key performance indicators, we have three main indicators, uh, middle school um, achievement, we have ninth grade success, and then our high school graduations, our high school completion. Um, because the school year is, is yet not over, we are entering grades on Friday and on Monday. Um, we don't have summative data to share with you today, but we have some information that um, we want to share for now. Um, middle school grades in quarters one to three, we stayed pretty consistent in uh, grades during comprehensive distance learning. And we are anticipating some growth in grades and attendance because again, um, we saw uh, just well attended days to the in-person opportunities for kids. They were, again, ready to see them, ready to see us, and we were ready to see them. Um, what we will have available after grading period is ninth grade on track data, and remember for a ninth grader to be on track, 
they need to have six credits and then they need to have passed Algebra 1. So we'll have that information for you coming up. And uh, we will have also, like Superintendent Perry said, uh, more information on graduation. We know that we have students that are working through their goals through the month of August to finish and graduate. Um, and then just a couple of reminders on trends. Um, we noticed that attendance and grades were lower during comprehensive distance learning. It was challenging to learn and engage fully through the screen. Um, but we are anticipating uh, some improvements in both grades and attendance as we brought students back and then as we are planning for five days or full engagement. To finish, I wanted to mention some uh, bright spots and some next steps. So uh, number one is the reintroduction of in-person in instruction was really successful um, starting in March with elementary and then following very shortly uh, by secondary. Um, um, our students were happy to, to come back to schools and we feel like our teachers were ready also for them. Um, we also uh, want to mention that the stability of grades and attendance, um, we believe, is because of the incredible dedication of our educators and the persistence of our students who stayed engaged. Um, and um, I know you have heard these in this room many, many times, but our facilities department, our operations, our teachers, our school administrators, all school personnel that put, um, that implemented all of the safety protocols and were able to keep kids and staff safe and limit the outbreaks was also a great celebration for us. N moving forward, we are very engaged in planning of summer school. We have a total of 145 summer school programs that start next week. We are very, very excited about that and we know that our families are too. And we are going to focus on unfinished learning, accelerated learning, and also just engagement and again, building stamina so we can keep our parents and our communities um, informed and then be ready for the fall. Um, for fall, our schools are um, uh, planning for five day instruction, full days of school. And then we are also in the middle of processes to hire teachers and then plan for academic supports through both SIA and ESSER. So this is what I have for you, and then uh, now I can answer any questions that you may have. So can we just have one quick question for yes. the okay. director, and any other questions, you can email it to them. Director Blasi, let's start with So Assistant Superintendent I don't have a problem saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I hope you get used to it. <laughs> um, do you have any, do you have a sense of uh, the second grade readers um, who are at high risk, um, what their participation currently is anticipated for summer school? Like, are they all signed up? Yes. I know that teachers have been very, very engaged in um, referring students and making phone calls to parents based on the needs of the learners, um, but I don't have the exact numbers to tell you, but I know that our teachers um, and, and school personnel have been um, trying to directly connect with families so that they can stay engaged and we can continue making progress. Um, you had mentioned 145 summer programs, 145. Do you know how many kids and what the age ranges are that we're going to serve over the summer with those many, that number, approximately? I don't have that number, but we can find out. Yeah, I think, uh, I know that our, it's K through 12, uh -huh. and I think we have like 1,900 in elementary alone. Pre-K through 12. Pre-K through 12. But, it's pre-K through 12, and we're just finishing up registration for those so we can get those numbers to you. Okay, thank you. And if I can add, this includes academic and also music, sports, just, you know, just yeah. a, a, an incredible list of opportunities. Director uh, Goss? Yeah. Director Lepolfion? And uh, uh, <laughs> student advisor, Mabinten? You don't have a question? Oh, Good. Right. I also pass. We'll go to are you, who's the next. Uh, All right. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cobb. All right. Uh, next report is um, Dr. Udos Natar. You're going to introduce our um, guest tonight.
they're going to join us. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they are. Oh, they. In a much later place. Mm -hmm. So, um, as as you recall, uh, we've been working with um, our partners from New York University. This is Director uh, Dr. Richard Gray and Matthew Gonzalez. They've been our, our partners um, in, in um, developing our reimagining school discipline processes. And they, uh, we had the privilege of, of hosting them in Oregon um, back in May, from May 22nd to May 25th. So they were able to engage in person with our students and staff. Um, and they did this um, so that they could um, learn a little bit more about what's important in terms of safety and safety needs for, for students and staff and our community. And then they would, they're developing a, a report or a memo in which they, they share their findings and um, share recommendations as we move forward with um, reimagining our school discipline and our trainings that, we move, that we're developing for next year. So they're gonna speak with us about their, their process and about their findings in their visit to, to Salem. And, and so without further ado, I'll, I'll give them the, the floor and then I'll wrap it up when they're done. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh boy. You're gonna have to talk loud. <laughs> Close to your mic. Can you hear us? Yep. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, thank you all. Here, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, we are going to uh, do this very quickly, uh, try to give you a quick overview of the report. Uh, thank you again. My name is Richard Gray. I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Metropolitan Center. Let my colleague introduce himself. Yeah, thanks everybody. Matt Gonzalez, Director of the Integration and Innovation Initiative at the Matt, could you come closer to your microphone because uh, we want the public also to hear you. Sure, yeah. Hey everybody, um, my name is Matt Gonzalez. I'm Director of the Integration and Innovation Initiative at the NYU Metro Center with Richard. Terrific. And so, uh, thank you for um, having us here. This is our second time we were able to give you a, a report from our, our, our earlier work. And this is going to be a report on the second phase of the work. And we'll go through it very quickly to give you an overview and then have some time for questions. Uh, let's start here. Um, the, our, our relationship began um, with um, the Salem Kaiser Public School District in January of this year. We were asked to help facilitate um, conversations around safety. And there was also a conversation about the appropriate relationship with law enforcement. Uh, our, our work has been in two phases. I'll go over very quickly the first phase, which many of you already know about because we reported. Uh, when we came into the district, there was clear evidence that there was conversation fatigue, particularly around the issue of the contract, and that people were skeptical about uh, a new engagement process really producing anything different. We heard from a number of people that uh, they felt like there had been enough discussion about that particular element uh, to be able to move forward. And so our conversation, uh, because we wanted to engage in a conversation around safety that included law, the issue of law enforcement, but not exclusive to it, we tried to figure out a way that we could recalibrate the sequencing of the work to have the decision about the contracts happen first, and then that would create a space for us to be able to open up a dialogue about uh, safety that would be more nuanced and broader. And that led us to our second phase of the work. And I'll let Matt take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, so, you know, the the creation of the, the decision in, in March, March really opened, opened up, up the, the second, second phase of this conversation. conversation. Um, following the, the, the decision, you know, there, the primary focus was to really engage in focused conversations directly with educators and young folks. And so over the, uh, over the course of March, up until um, May, we engaged in a number of conversations that were actually really pulled together and facilitated in a lot of ways by the district with educators um, to engage in conversations about, okay, now that this decision is made, what, 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 you know, what, what do we do now, right? And, and really leveraging the expertise um, and, and experience of educators to really have that conversation. We certainly um, continued that conversation in May um, 
it feels like years ago, but it was just a month ago or last <laughs> month. Um, but we engaged, you know, the, the idea was really to engage the experts and educators in this conversation and then to really make sure we center it around young folks. And so um, obviously we were there, we were in Salem for a week, um, got to got to see the sites, got to experience um, some cloudy weather and some sunny days all in the same mix. Um, but really the intent there was to really engage and to, to continue engaging the conversations around young folks and educators who are directly impacted by school safety issues, right? Decisions that get made by the board, by the superintendent have a direct impact on young people and educators. And we really wanted to make sure that, that um, the larger engagement process that does need to happen is grounded in the priorities, the experiences and the goals that we've set out by young people, right? And so, you know, we, our, our, our second phase really was about listening to educators, listening to young folks um, and making sure that you know, we got a, a targeted and representative group, representative group of the district, right? There are about 40,000 plus students in Salem Kaiser. We were also doing this in the context of COVID. And so understood that we were not gonna be able to engage every student in the district. Um, again, stating that that should be something part of the process of going forward. But the work was really about making sure that we had a diverse cross section. So we had a number of meetings with young people uh, from, from every high school, from two middle schools. And as you can see, um, this is kind of an overview of our, our meeting schedule. We had, a, we had a, a packed schedule from day to day, really to make sure that we got as many voices as possible. So we engaged directly with young people from elementary school to folks who are, you know, who are just graduating out of your district, right? And from every high school, from two middle schools, um, and then a number of um, educator and um, you know professional groups that directly support and develop um, policies, practices around behavior and, and positive behavior. And then we also engaged with one group of parents who are advocates for students who have disabilities. Um, and so you know again, the, the intent was not to um, engage the entire district, but was really, as Richard said, to given that there was a decision made, it really opened the door to a, a wide array of conversations about safety um, that, didn't, that didn't just uh, lend themselves to physical safety. So Richard, you can actually go to the next um, question, or sorry, the next slide. And so what we did really was make sure that the, the, the framing of the conversation we had around safety included physical safety, but also expanded for young folks uh, and educators to think about emotional and psychological safety, right? Young people have been, you know, for, for the most part, um, learning virtually for most of the year, um, also have potentially experienced a tremendous amount of loss. Um, physically, you know, with family and other things. And so we wanted to understand, like, what are students really feeling like they need when they come back to school? And so that really led us, led, led us to these questions, right? And so, you know, the, the first question really unpacking safety for young people really opened up a lot of great ideas. The second question was really about ensuring that students have a sense of belonging, right? And really understanding that a sense of safety is connected to a sense of belonging and feeling connected to schools. Um, the third question was really about, okay, you all are talking about what you want. How does this feel? How do you want it to feel? What are the actual things that young people think are needed to be invested in? What are the resources? Um, and I think the, the word we just like, what are the things you think the district and your schools need to invest in to make this all a reality? And so we got a lot of really amazing ideas from young folks as well. And then, you know, we also wanted to make sure that we were thinking about what are ways that students um, can show up for each other and support support this idea of feeling connected and included. And, and I think what we learned um, is that, you know, young folks are really, you know, I think, I don't know what it is, but in this moment, young folks are really just keen on helping and supporting each other, right? We really got this sense of a desire for community um, amongst young people from different backgrounds um, and from, from diverse experiences. You know, we were talking with students who were part of leadership groups. We were also talking to young people who were part of um, equity groups. We we're also, um, you know, talking to young people who were part of groups that, you know, that, that, that may have just been kind of random groups of folks together, but we really got a diverse group of uh, folks to really engage in these conversations with us. Um, and, and Richard, uh, is this my section or yours? Sorry. I'll, I'll take it. Go for it. You tag team it. And so here's just sort of a, and I think uh, uh, Matt gave you a taste of some of the findings. And so we want to lay out the findings and some recommendations um, and then open it up for, for conversations and questions. Uh, but one of the things that we found is um, we were a little concerned on how we were going to write this report having done all these um, these interviews or, and these, have these conversations because we, we, 
we anticipated that there would probably be some wide ranging perspectives. But what we were overwhelmed, what struck us is the overwhelming consistency we heard from students and all the stakeholders across the response, not only across the different schools, but we heard similar things from elementary school students that we heard from high school students about coming back. And one of the things that was looming in every conversation was the context of COVID uh, and the eventual return. Students were really thinking about and had been thinking about what does it mean to come back to school and what do I want my school to be? It was almost like they had really queued themselves up for our conversation. They were sort of prepared and had been thinking, maybe for a year, had been thinking about what is it that I really want from my school? Uh, and so uh, they were really prepared. And so the organi we've organized these ideas and the set of themes that we think will be helpful in presenting. I'll turn it back over to Matt. Awesome, thanks Richard. Yeah, and so as Richard said, you know, we, we heard a lot um, and, and, and we were kind of like, oh my God, how are we gonna organize this? But I mean, as we got through through the week, it's really, we really started to hear a really profound echo from a lot of young people across the district, as Richard said. And so the main kind of, the top level theme that we heard was this idea of care and connection, this, this desire for young folks to feel a sense of connection after having been disconnected for, you know, over a year, right? Um, and then this also this idea that, you know, as they're returning and, and bringing a lot with them and understanding that a lot of young people are, uh, that, you know, that are from different backgrounds are gonna be bringing a lot with them, trauma, um, experiences, loss, all of that needs to be kind of, kind of caught with care, right? And this idea that we're really leaning into the social emotional wellness um, you know, for, for young people. And, 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 and so what came out of the, that, that, that theme, that idea of care and connection was like two kind of main points, right? This idea that, that as I said before, students are really open to driving this um, and have laid out things that they wanna do and student driven initiatives that they think are productive, they wanna see expanded. But then also this idea of, of structural and cultural change, this, this idea that care and connection needs to be a, a theme across schools, across the district again it doesn't have to be cookie cutter but this idea that there's a priority set on this idea of building connections rebuilding connections and also building systems and supports for care for young people again who and whatever we're going to bring back with them so that was really the overarching umbrella of these of these findings and these themes but you know as we started to dig a little bit deeper what we started to understand is that this idea of care connection really feeding into this sense of safety had a lot to do with a sense of belonging and inclusion. And so what we did hear pretty consistently across the board um, was that there, there, there's a, a feeling and a sense that the accountability for racial aggressions and other manifestations of bias is not, as one is not consistent, um, often not responded to. We talked to a young woman who said she had been called the N word more times than she could count and has never ever once, she's about to graduate, right? Um, has never once felt a sense of accountability, not even got an apology, right? And there was a consistent narrative across the district and across, across conversations that students didn't feel like when, when racial aggressions were, were occurring in particular, that there was a sense of a structure or a support system to respond to those that made students feel safe, right? And so then they felt disconnected. And so again, really understanding that this idea of, of a sense of belonging and inclusion really requires a sense of accountability around racial aggressions and again, other manifestations of bias. And as we were talking about this, the idea of bullying came up, right? And this idea of, of what, it, what actually is bullying because that's become this, this blanket statement for a lot of interactions of bias, right? And, and then actually systems of accountability that don't respond to those, those, those instances of bias, right? Whether they be racial, economic, linguistic, or other forms of bias, or, 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 or young people's sexual identities and presentations of that, right? And so really wanted to make sure that that's, that's highlighted as we're thinking about belonging and inclusion. Secondly, this idea of inclusive and equitable practices. Young folks felt like, you know, if we're gonna be talking about a sense of belonging and inclusion, we really actually need to uh, see policies, practices, and other systems created to support equitable practices and also inclusive practices. And so they name things that they're willing to do themselves. They also name things that they want the district to invest in and think about, which brings us to our last theme, which is thinking about like, what are, what are the investments, right? And so again, there's a, a number of things that are outlined and bulleted in our report. We tried to condense them into a, a, you know, a couple bullets here, but really thinking broad, broadly again, like how are we centering, front ending this idea of investments in social emotional learning supports um, we're thinking about you know, transforming behavior um, and thinking about how to restorative justice, 
culturally responsive practices all feed into creating that sense of investment in equity and wellness, that sense of belonging and inclusion, all towards the sense of safety and, 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 and wellness across the district, right? And, and, and I think to kind of bookend some of this, you know, we, we got into conversations with young people about when these things happen or when, when things are happening outside of the classroom, how are teachers making space to engage in critical conversation? Like, how do we analyze these issues um, and really make sure students have the tools to more appropriately navigate and analyze the world around them, right? And so we heard a couple things. Young folks were saying they want to have these conversations. They want, uh, you know, issues that happen outside of the classroom to filter and to be culturally responsively built into the classroom. They also know that teachers either one, don't want to have the conversation, two, don't know how to have the conversation, or three, feel threatened by a narrative that we can't talk about race, we can't talk about equity, somehow it's bad to do that, right? And so there were these three items that seemed like barriers to the educators across the district from really supporting young people and what they felt like they needed in terms of conversations about race, equity, um, and other issues of bias and, and inequality. And so, you know, those are the three kind of themes obviously condensed into a, um, you know, a slide. I'll let Richard kind of take it to kind of unpack a little bit more of our recommendations from these themes. Uh, thank you, Matt. Let me go back here. Uh, and so, um, as Matt mentioned, our, our, our report goes into a little more detail, but I want to go through these very quickly. And I think a number of them are, are pretty self-explanatory. And the first thing is, is to make sure that we translate, that you translate what you hear here, the things that you, you think are relevant and, and purposeful into district action. Uh, we heard from a number of people when we were having these conversations, they were saying, well, what are you going to do with this stuff, right? What, what, why are we talking to you, right? And so there's an expectation that um, something will come of, uh, of this work. And I think there are two elements, and they, they speak to diff two different, uh, a couple of different recommendations. But I think the first is that there is a response to what we're sharing here that I think folks would want to hear from the district and from the schools, and that's how do you translate what you're hearing into um, participatory, transparent, and, and accountable school and district action, right? And so there are ways of, of saying, I lifted up a particular idea and the district met me and the school met me by responding to it. That leads us to, uh, I think, a couple of things that uh, I think are possibilities or create, make that a more of a possibility uh, that emerged from it. Number one is, uh, we uh, we identified and saw a number of places where there were pockets of really good work happening. Um, we all we would run into somebody and they were running a restorative justice program. Or we would run into somebody and they had started a well. They were developing a wellness room, or one of the students was trying to develop a mentor program. All of these great things uh, that were throughout the state. And one of the things that we recommend is that we that you identify what those elements are and identify the people that are leading them. And rather than having to build something from scratch you can really bring some of those programs to scale, right? Being able to link some of the leaders in those schools together so that you take pockets of school um, success and effective action and you create, you can invest in creating and building it at the school level, but, it, but if you link them together, you actually build a district capacity that could be utilized to actually uh, move folks along. And so we've, we, there were a number of, of leaders, educators, young people, uh, parents who I think were ready to take on this work. And so I think there's a way for the district to actually to invest in places that are already doing work uh, and so that you're not really starting from scratch. There's also, you know, as, as Matt mentioned, we did this at a at a very small scale, although, and we had a very representative group of students. It was it was really fun, I have to say. This is my, our, our, this is my first uh, plane flight. It was my first time in a school in well over a year. And it was really exciting just to be with with students, even the middle school students who gave us a hard time, which is fun being in a, in a, in a setting with middle school students giving you a hard time. Um, but it was a, what we found is that people were saying, well, can we get the information from, from this conversation? Can we have continued conversations? And so one of our recommendations is to keep this engagement going, right? that there are people who were at the sites, students, teachers, others, who are ready to say, we'd like to actually invite other people to engage in these conversations and others. And so we believe that they're uh, with support and we are prepared. One of the things we're going to talk with the district about is preparing 
uh, support for facilitation for these things, but we believe that there's the capacity for people to actually do this on their own, not only the capacity of desire to take this, so that this becomes less of an event and more of a practice that you continue to do on a regular basis. Uh, link these safety findings to the district's reimagining discipline initiative. There were a number of issues and ideas that clearly overlapped with what you what would come up as you're thinking about a restorative um, practice discipline um, structure. And so there was a real natural alignment, I think, between what we were what we were lifting up in the safety and what would be addressed by the school discipline. Uh, the extra investments and investment. Uh, this is a interesting time. If, if we were having these conversations back in March or February, we'd be in a very different economic situation. But with the money that we that's coming from the federal government, there's a real opportunity to invest not only in this work, but invest in a bold way, something that really uh, speaks to people's needs in ways that you don't always have as a district. It's sort of a, a unique position to have those resources to be able to respond to it. And so this becomes a place where your extra money becomes a way for you to really put a stamp on, on, on what you're doing. And then I'm going to just give a, a final conclusion, and I'm going to ask Matt to do this because um, we were supposed to actually engage in this work for, I'm going to take off the, uh, the recommendations here. Um, I'll move to the next one. We were supposed to uh, do this, this contract was supposed to end sometime in March, but given COVID and the dynamics, it, it had to be extended for, for reasons because we, we were really committed to doing the work. But the narrative over that time has really been interesting. Uh, uh, when we first came into it, it was really dominated by a conversation about police and schools. And I understand, understandably so. It's, a, it's an important issue and a major issue. Uh, but one of the things that that dominance in the conversation did is that while it included what is, what is a necessary and important element in safety, talking about law enforcement and physical safety, it actually ended up dwarfing and creating and taking up the air for any other conversation around safety. Uh, and so I f we, we feel like the decision to end the SRO contract doesn't preclude there being a, a conversation, and I believe there is a conversation about a relationship with law enforcement, but it created a space for people to actually be free to talk about safety um, and particularly the impacts of COVID, the protests uh, and the experiences that they had. And, and it created a framework that now allows for you to have a conversation with law enforcement that's guided by a set of principles that are driven by a more nuanced and a more comprehensive conversation about safety. And so in, in our view, it does not preclude there being in involvement or relation with, with law enforcement. But what it did is it shifted, and now that conversation will happen with a set of principles and values that are grounded in a sort of a broader sense of, of safety and also in a broader sense of where people are coming back from COVID. The last point is, I was really impressed with the students that we met. Um, there was a really new, I won't, I won't say appreciation, but a new sense of what school is and can be. Uh, and I think this generation of young people are really trying to recalibrate what, what an inclusive high school experience is. I, I just heard a lot of conversations that I don't normally hear from high school students about, we just wanna take on some of what is really some, it's almost like it was high school cool, right? This idea of there are kids who are in and out. And one of the statements, and I'm gonna leave it with my, my last statement, with one of the statements that came from one of the students, he said that every student who walks in a school should have a circle of people, students, adults, and others that know them, that care about them, and that they trust. And it seemed like the students are committing themselves to try to create spaces like that in schools. And so it's a very unique and I think a, 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 uh, an opportune time for there to be investments in creating a new community of caring and connection in schools, because I think that the, the, the folks in the schools not only are willing to do that, I think they're desiring an opportunity to be bold in that, in that respect. I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt for the last comment and then we'll- Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, thanks Richard for just kind of laying laying those last pieces out. I think what, what, what I wanna kind of conclude with is, 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 is really what, you know, echoing what Richard said. There's a, there's a profound opportunity right now to think about 
you know, how does the district <clears throat> align and orient and be responsive to the, to the narratives, the experiences, the needs of young people and families after COVID? I think we, you know, you all have set up a, a, a process it, at least around the issues of school safety and, and hopefully into the discipline conversations to really, again, be responsive, not just by listening, but actually responding by policy, making policy change, making needed investments. Um, I think, you know, we come, we're, you know, here from New York City, right? so-called progressive city, right? Some of the work that we are being heard is named, some of the policy decisions you all are, are thinking about and grappling with are actually far beyond what we're, you know, what we're doing and dealing with here in the city, right? And so I just want to like really, you know, encourage more of this conversation, right? More of these opportunities for young people to really be at the center of this, the discussion. Again, as we've always said, that doesn't preclude uh, parents and other stakeholders from being in the conversation, but when you center it around the priorities and needs of young people, um, the, the parameters get to be a little more clear, the goals get to be a little bit more consistent, and I think what we heard literally from young folks who were rolling around the ground and, you know, as a second or third grader to, a, you know, again, someone about to graduate and go off into, you know, the, the so-called real world, there was so much consistency in this desire. Really, again, this, you know, last, this one kid, really, you know, young person was just like, I want to see people smile, right? This idea that, that they want to see a sense of care, community, and love really in the district. And I felt like there's a sense of that across it. And so I'll, I'll end there saying that you all have a profound opportunity and I'm gonna turn it off because it's loud in my neighborhood. be remiss if we we did all this work with NYU and then just just left it at that and, and said well we we did some some listening and and we had a, have a report and and now we're ready to, to move on and so what I want to show on this slide real quick is is how we're taking um, the the findings that we have from NYU and how we're um, using those to to move to move forward right and, and one thing that I do want to share is that um, after we reviewed their findings and we all sat in this boardroom the Saturday of their visit after they'd went through all, all their listening sessions, we found that their findings uh, and their themes around wellness, connection, investment in students, they really align with the stakeholder, um, the stakeholder and SIA um, engagement sessions that we had from a couple of years ago. And so what we found was that we were, we were doing the right things, which were um, investing deeply in students' social and emotional well-being. Um, and just as a reminder, um, I always want to sh share with people that we have already been responsive to some of these needs that we've heard. And you can see that by the number of counselors that we've hired, the number of social workers that were hired. We're very pleased to share that we have a, um, that every feeder system has a, a, a social worker available to them and every middle school and high school has a social worker dedicated to them and that's our testament to the type of investments we're putting in through SIA for our, um, our investment in social emotional health. We're developing uh, wellness rooms at the middle school and that's a safe space for students to, to go to as a, as a um, inclusion strategy, not a, not a pull out strategy so that they can decompress, that they can get coaching and get back into, into the classroom when they're in a space to learn. Um, Importantly, from a, from a system standpoint, we're really trying to revise our systems and review our systems so that we're being as inclusive as, as, as possible. And that um, is where we tie in our reimagining school discipline work that we spoke a lot about. Um, also, uh, SRMS is working very dil diligently to make sure that they're developing safety trainings and protocols 
so that our um, principals uh, and people that work the most closely with uh, students and are, that are responsible for student safety um, have understand what the protocols are, protocols are and, have, and know what they need to know to keep kids safe. Um, also, we're continuing to invest in staff. And in the last few weeks, we spent a lot of time, again, with our, our district leadership, developing um, our, our professional development plans, um, looking at our, the resources that we have at our disposal, um, and making sure that we are, are um, doing what we need to do to, to gather as much information, whether it's talking to students and staff, um, or really uh, looking at our, the, the, the data that we have at hand um, to do some planning for next year. Um, so from that, we're gonna see continued culturally responsive trainings, um, especially in culturally responsive instruction, and continue equity PD, right? And um, something that I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to share as well is that our equity PD is transitioning from what I would say is, is, is more of a learning and, and, and um, staff growth phase to an action-centered phase where we're, we're going to um, um, find really systems that we can monitor and ensure that we're being as equitable as possible. So these are all the things that we're doing that aligns with, with what we've learned. Um, Lynette. Thanks, Lynette. Your cheering section, Lynette. <laughs> so these are the things that we're doing to make sure we're taking care of kids. Thank you. Uh, any, any quick questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Hyen? Uh, advice from Abington. We'll kind of go around in this. Okay. I love it. Yeah, thanks. Director Lepol Pion. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear you guys are doing the work, and I just want to say thank you so much for uh, coming, I mean, d the district, and then also uh, NYU folks for uh, doing this. I mean, you guys are up right now, what is it, 1039 right now? Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your commitment to helping us, and then also thank you to, the, to you know, Ethan and our district for uh, kicking butt and <laughs> taking care of kids, so thank you, guys. Dr. Goss, Dr. Kylo, Vice Chair Beto, Dr. Blasi. Hey, it's more of a comment, um, just real quick. So I, I agree with Lynette, this is all really, really good, and it has happened very quickly and very responsive, and, um, and I so much appreciate that um, and why you came out because sometimes it's really great to have an outside look and a voice and um, one thing that we keep coming back to and and this is not a criticism but we keep hearing it and I, I I'm excited to see where the district goes with this but uh, because Lynette you and your peers identified this as well in your work is um, creating a space for teachers to feel comfortable or to be educated on how to have the conversations mm -hmm. because I still believe strongly that not creating that space, not teaching how to, teaching our educators how to have those conversations, whether they're um, nuanced by culture or race or gender or whatever, um, if they don't feel comfortable having those conversations, then they're not likely to have those conversations and that's sometimes I think where things escalate and become problems where maybe they can be handled in the classroom, in the moment or uh, so I just, that's one I think we keep coming back to that I find fascinating and it seems like a low tech, low cost. No, yeah. it's a, oh, it's <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so thank you guys. We really, really appreciate your work. I, I have a quick two questions that are kind of related. So let's say 10 years or 25 years from now, what would I see in this town if I come back, if I'm alive? What will that end point look like? It's a visionary, aspirational goal. What would five years from now look like? What would six months from now look like? Because we have 90 different communities and we really want all of them to understand what I call my equity 2.0. That means every community has to understand why we are doing what we are doing for each other so that together we can recognize that we are all tied to each other in common destiny. So what would that answer look like? The second part is restorative justice is a concept where different parties have to at least participate or agree to participate. If one is not 
in the same ability to kind of tolerate and participate, then how can we uh, kind of enforce a restorative practice? It's kind of antithesis to what restorative practice is supposed to be. Do you mind commenting on those two? So are you asking yeah. NYU? So those are big What are the vision? Yeah. What, what do we see? Questions. How do we measure yeah. that what we are doing is really working? Is it yeah. just a process? Or are we going to see some changes in terms of what outcome do we go back and tell our community? Second thing, how do we engage groups which are not ready to participate in restorative practice? We can't do, if we compel them to do it. Push your button. Let's say, let's say a student or a certain community don't understand or the concept of restorative practice. It has to be uh, agreed upon. Both groups have to agree to participate in that rules of engagement <coughs> using. I think that this is a really great conversation to have with them, kind of in a learning process. Okay. Um, it's almost 8 o'clock, and All we right. have a lengthy agenda to get through. So I feel very confident that both Mr. Gray and Mr. Gonzalez are available to us because we have their email addresses if we want to engage. That's okay. You don't have to answer this today, but I'm just kind of lost in this conversation. What can I go back to my community and tell them? What do they see in five years or 25 years from now? You don't have to answer this. Maybe sometime later we can, eat, we can I, I, talk privately. I would leave it to the district, district to answer. answer. I do you think, think part, part of building in, in whether or not it, it is successful is to build in the participation of the folks in the schools. I mean, in, in the work that we do, we always do an evaluation of the work that we do afterwards, right? Because we believe the people who are actually being impacted or the people who are receiving the services are the best ones to be able to tell us that. And so I think that, I think you're right. It would be great to create a goals process. I would actually make that a part of an engagement process because part of what you want to do is have goals that everybody feels ownership over. And I do think that we built the structure on that. Uh, on the restorative practices, I, I'm, we're not experts. We do have people who are connected to that. But my understanding is that there's, there's, you can set up a restorative system, but there's also restorative principles on how you engage people, right? This idea of, so the restorative practices are things that you can practice, whereas like you said, a, a full restorative justice circle does require a level of investment uh, in it. But I, I, Matt, I know you wanted to sort of say something briefly to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll be quick. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think what, what I'm hearing is like, how do we respond to harm, right? And there are restorative justice practices, like a circle that you would use to respond to that. Restorative justice is not just re like a circle, right? It's actually a set of systems and, and belief systems and practices and culture, right? And so part of the idea is that you don't just say, oh, har harm happened, let's throw a circle together. It's actually, we've been building a culture of restorative practices and principles throughout and so again it, it you don't always get a like you know willing parties to participate but what you, what you've done is build a culture and a system of accountability around restorative practices so the idea that there's no accountability within restorative schools and, and restorative cultures is is not true at all and, and inconsistent with the ways that restorative justice and restorative practices are effectively in implemented and so certainly open to a larger conversation um, and can bring in more experts around that but you know i think when we're thinking about harm we need to understand that restorative restorative work is, is about cultural change versus just responding to harm that's part of it that is just one aspect of, of restorative practices that you should be thinking about Richard and Matt, um, we'll let you sign off. You're welcome to stay on for another hour. You're welcome to. I know. I know that's probably oh, what you're. you're us right you now. were really hoping for. Late night show for you. Okay. You, should we do the budget hearing? Yes. Let's go to the budget hearing. All right. Have a great night. All right. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is open the budget hearing, and um, you have all sat through the um, budget committee process, so you know what's included in the um, approved budget by the budget committee. Uh, what we know right now is the budget is built on 9.4 uh, billion at the state um, of state school fund dollars. Currently, the state school fund is at 9.3, so it has gone up a little bit. Right now, if the legislature lands on 9.3, the budget that you'll adopt tonight has about 3.2 uh, million less than we'll have about 3.2 million less in contingency. When we initially um, started um, 
pr uh, presented the budget, that was about a 6.1% contingency, and it's a little bit lower than that now with that, um, depending on where the state school fund lands. Also remember, um, built into the budget process, there were not any um, cost of living insurance increases because we are in uh, bargaining with our association. So that's the reason to keep that um, contingency still a little higher. Uh, we are still advocating for 9.6 billion. We know that roll forward for Salem-Kaiser is 9.8 billion of if we were rolling forward the exact staff. So with that, um, that's my summary on the budget process and I'll open it up to see if you have any questions. Is there any questions? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hearing none. Oh, is there any? Director Hines. Oh, Director Hines, oh, sorry. I just wanted to clarify that we did not increase the number of custodial staff. Is that correct? I mean, uh, we didn't increase above what you had initially proposed correct. in your budget message. Yeah, there was an increase in the budget message, but we haven't added anything in the budget from the time you have um, approved or the budget committee approved the budget. There's any, no changes. Any other questions? Okay. All right, uh, the next thing is uh, public testimony on the 2021-22 um, approved budget and um, Director McDaniel, is there any testimony for the budget? No, there isn't. All right. Thanks. Um, so with that, uh, we can go ahead and close the budget hearing. The budget hearing is now closed. Okay, you wanna keep going? Yep. All right. Go to the action item. All right, the first action item is the LGBTQ plus Pride Month proclamation. And um, before, um, I just wanna do a quick introduction of this. We have a uh, program associate for the first time in Salem-Kaiser that is an LGBTQ plus program associate. She works on um, policy for us and training for staff. Um, she helps run some st uh, student groups, Bailey Anderson. So huge shout out to Bailey. She took on um, the rewrite of this um, particular resolution uh, for uh, about six weeks with a group of staff and some students. So this, the people that wanted to be named were uh, Kayla Flocker, Brandy Rawls, Megan Ferreris Quintrell, Rhonda Kaiser, Scott Rick, Laura Kemper, Paul Quash, Kyle Ward, Erica Haggart, Shannon uh, Stoutenberg, and Kimberly uh, Morrison. Um, there were a few others, a few other students as well that participated, and they really came to this with a, they wanted to have a resolution that was positive and represented um, our community of LGBTQ plus kids as, and uh, staff as assets, and so they were trying to um, reshape it. They felt like last year's um, looked from a deficit model rather than asset-based model. So uh, Bailey, to you and your team, a uh, huge shout out for the way you uh, rewrote the um, proclamation this, this month. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Chair Shonda Geary. Okay, so Can you pull your microphone down? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you know, thank you. And I'm going to invite uh, Director Blasi to read the second uh, you know, part of this proclamation. And I really feel honored to do this with you, Director Blasi. So the LGBTQ plus Pride Month proclamation. Whereas Pride Month as a celebration started in response to the Stonewall Uprising in June of 1969 and the following challenges and triumphs and is celebrated annually as we continue to advocate for equal rights for all. And whereas it is because of the LGBTQ plus civil rights movement started by the activists like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera that LGBTQ plus community has rights and recognitions, recognition as members of our society and whereas specifically including LGBTQ plus community, people who are two-spirit lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, cure, uh, pansexual, asexual, gender fluid, non-binary, intersex, as well as heterosexual and cisgender allies, and whereas current and former presidential administrations and the National Education Association have declared June as the Pride Month for LGBTQ plus community, and 
whereas the presence of LGBTQ plus individuals in the United States Armed Forces has greatly impacted the service and protection of this country. And whereas our K-12 student staff and extended community benefit from LGBTQ plus voices and stories being amplified and heard, and whereas our community is enriched because of the diversity of our population, and whereas Pride Month encompasses all LGBTQ plus individuals from all demographic demographics and backgrounds, and whereas when we show respect and acceptance at school, it allows us to acknowledge who we are as unique individuals with diverse and intersecting identities, and... Whereas there are approximately 1.9 million LGBTQ plus youth ages 13 through 17 in the United States, and approximately 20,000 to 25,000 LGBTQ plus students ages 13 to 17 in Oregon, and... Whereas gender sexually alliance, gender sexuality alliance GSA clubs act to support LGBTQ plus youth in schools, whether socially or to enact change in their schools, such as promoting LGBTQ plus inclusivity and in education or creating gender affirming spaces like gender neutral bathrooms for all. These clubs are supported by our district and protected by federal and Oregon state law and Whereas, in order to recognize and support the unique obstacles LGBTQ plus K-12 students, staff, and extended community navigate, the district is working to bring more inclusive language to spread awareness of diff different sexual orientations and gender identities and is doing more to show that we are proud of our community. Whereas, LGBTQ plus pride is to be celebrated year-round but in the month of June, we encourage schools, teachers, and staff to display uplifting LGBTQ plus symbols and images inside and or outside their buildings and classrooms, such as posters, stickers, and flags, with the goal of promoting respect for the LGBTQ plus community and whereas cisgender and heterosexual teachers and staff will be supported as they act as allies for LGBTQ plus K-12 students, staff, and extended community. And whereas LGBTQ plus K-12 staff, students, will be able to express themselves authentically and be celebrated for who they are. And whereas the school board is committed to creating a safe and welcoming school district for all as it recognizes our LGBTQ plus K-12 Students and staff have the same rights as their cisgendered and heterosexual peers. Now, therefore, the Salem-Kaiser School District Board of Directors proclaims June 2021 to be LG LGBTQ plus Pride Month and urges our community to join us in celebrating our LGBTQ plus K-12 students and staff. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bassi. Is that a motion to approve this? I move that we approve the LGBTQ plus Pride Month proclamation. Okay. I'll second. Dr. Goss seconds it. Dr. Lepolpion moves the motion. And is there any discussion? Dr. Hine, you're recognized. Uh, yes, I'd like to propose an amendment to the proclamation, adding the following two statements. Uh, they are from the year before, basically, but I think they're very important uh, for our kids. Uh, whereas LGBTQ plus youth faced increased bullying and are almost five times more likely to have attempted suicide compared to youth who identify as non-LGBTQ plus and whereas the school board is committed to helping end the crisis of bullying and suicide in our community. I want these kids to feel safe and I want, I want them to be second. treated well. Okay, Dr. Kyler has seconded. <laughs> Any discussion? Just cut on? me off, Paul. Go ahead. Come on. <laughs> Dr. I change. Okay, any discussion? Dr. Blasi. I think it's, it's been an honor to uh, see this proclamation uh, grow to reflect um, not just the challenges that our students and our staff face, but um, to focus on um, the unique individuals and their, uh, what they bring to our community. And so I, I thank the district for reaching out to students 
allowing them to work on this and thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Bethel, do you have anything? Director Pailo. No, I think I think the two sentences the two sentence addition does not diminish the resolution and I think it strengthens it. Director God. Thank you. That doesn't offend anybody else. Dr. Lepolpion, please. Uh, yeah, and we're talking about the amendment, correct? Yes, please. Okay. Um, my only question would be, uh, does anybody know why? Because it was on there last time, right? And then since then, we had a group of uh, students and LGBTQ folks look at it, and they changed it to this. And so I guess my question would be, why would they do that? Um, and I, I, we might not have an answer, but I would assume that it was done on purpose. Um, they, do, does anybody know? Yeah, what I know is, um, I, and I don't know specifically those exact, but what their general belief was, as I understood it through Bailey, is they really wanted the proclamation to be positive and asset-based mm -hmm. and not focused on um, suicide was one thing that they brought up that they thought last year's had a, um, just too much reference. And so, and I have not had a chance, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to run those two statements by them to ask specifically related yeah. to those statements. So sh okay. in short, we don't know all that reasoning. Uh, Advisor Mabinton, do you oh, have? Well, I think, I think Ms. Superintendent Perry just said the reasoning. They wanted to be positive and they said they didn't Got want it. to focus it on suicide. Okay. So I would respect that. Mm -hmm. I am, since we did call students to help remake this, so I'm happy about that, and I think we should respect them in doing that. Director Hyman, yeah, do you have anything? Well, we'll come to you. Come yeah, back. I was going to finish what I was saying. Oh, yeah, Jesse, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that I, I think that was really well-intentioned, and I want to say thank you to Marty for, for bringing that yeah, up, agree. and to Paul. I mean, I think that's, uh, it just goes to show that you really care, and I think that's an awesome thing. Uh, the only thing is, kind of like what Lynette said, is just, they purposefully removed it uh, and wrote it this way. And so I just, my, I'm not against that. I just want to really respect the work that these Thank people you. put into it. Director Hein, do you have any discussion? Yeah, I have something to discuss. Yeah, for me, I will support this amend, uh, proclamation with the amendment that has been introduced. But, you know, this proclamation is very important for me. It will mean a lot for me personally as I want to dedicate this to the memory of Dr. John Fryer, who was my mentor, teacher, and father figure. He was the one who brought us to Temple <coughs> University of Philadelphia in 1996. We stayed in his home until we could find a place. He was a trailblazer in the gay rights movement for his famous speech in 1972 in American Psychiatric Association Convention and led to the di uh, removal of homosexuality from the DSM diagnosis. He saw in us what we could never imagine then in 1996. I never thought I'll be sitting in this chair today. I don't know what he saw in me. Our little daughter sat with him when he would play his piano for her. We never missed all the holiday meals in his home. He never missed when we celebrated the birthday of our son. It was perfect communion and community when we gathered. I'm sure he'll be watching from heaven with pride that I get to read this. And as chair of our school board, we recognize Pride Month 2021. For me, it is a celebration of the sacredness of life when we support this proclamation. It takes incredible courage to come out in front of family, friends, school, work, society at large. Even today, many LGBTQ plus youth face challenges associated with minority stress or the unique experiences associated with victimization and grapple with the feelings of shame, rejection, depression, and sense of lack of connectedness. They often are the targets of abuse, trauma, bullying, and at risk for suicide. I know we want it to be a positive, but I see this I bear witness to this in my practice every day. And unless we are willing to acknowledge that, we really cannot change. We cannot reform. We cannot change our thing. This is clearly wrong. 
I want our LGBTQ plus youth to know that this nation belongs to you and you belong to our nation. The Salem Kaiser Public School belongs to you and you belong to our Salem Kaiser Public School. You are our children, siblings, friends, family, as much as anyone else. And there should be no other reason. You know, I insisted on coming to this school board meeting in person to read this. You know, sharing with Superintendent Perry, you know, family. You know, my wife is in the hospital, but I really insisted on coming is because of Dr. John Fryer. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this country. He met me in St. Lucia and he invited me. And I do, so I really feel this is an important thing. I want our children to feel that they are part of our children. They want, I want them to feel that they belong. But, you know, so I would support it with the amendment. I'll vote in favor of it, and I request you all to please support this with that amendment, because it's really important. It saves lives. So thank you. There is no other discussion. Are we ready to take a vote? I, I do have an answer from our LGBTQ plus um, program associate, but that's, I'll leave it up to you whether you want me to bring that in. You can read it if yeah. you want to. She, um, really, what she said is um, we really, we didn't want to, this to be trauma focused and we didn't want to be reduced to mental health statistics, something we can cover during mental health awareness month instead. Okay, thank you. All right, Director Hyen, how do you vote? We're voting on the amendment portion. Yes, only, amendment correct. portion is the only one on the table now. Right, and I vote aye. Director Lepolpion. Out of respect to the group who wrote it, I would say no. Okay, Director Goss. <clears throat> I would accept the amendment. I would accept the amendment. And so how do you vote? vote? I. Yes. Director, aye. Hello. Vice Chair Beto. Aye. Director Blasi. If the amendment does pass, we still vote on the original. Correct. That's right. Mm -hmm. I vote no on the amendment out of respect for the preparers. Okay. I vote aye. So I just want to know who all voted aye. Last track of it. So Director Hine voted aye. Director Goss? Was aye. Aye. Director Kylo aye. aye. Myself aye. Okay, and uh, Vice Chair Bethel aye. Correct. Aye. Okay. The one who voted no. Director Lepolpion, no. And Director Glassy, no. So the motion passes with amendment. Right? Yes. Uh, so Just the amendment the passes. Amendment. Now right. we have to now we have to go vote back. on the whole th whole thing with the amendment in it. Okay, so I just believe. the amendment passes. So now is that okay now can we there's no need to discuss or can we just go we ahead and round? Is there any discussion on this? The whole thing with the amendment. Well you may permit discussion. It's been moved, seconded and discussed. You can yep. discuss it more if you wish to. No, I don't. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Lepolpion, do you have a question? Sorry, I didn't know we were gonna add an amendment, so. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think it's, uh, there was a time where I heard a story from one of my, one of my grandmas, from one of my adoptive families I was with. Uh, you know, and she actually lost uh, election to the House of Representatives here in town uh, because my grandfather came out as gay. Uh, and this was a long time ago. Hmm. Um, and that was, you know, a story that I heard, you know, growing up throughout my life, <laughs> you know, so that's, pr it's pretty cool that to see that now, you know, as a government body ourselves, that we're, we're not only accepting of people, uh, but also we're able to read this Pride Month proclamation and support uh, the our LGBTQ plus kids. And so I just want to say that um, it's pretty cool how far we've come. Thank you. So we're going to be, voting on the proclamation with amendment which was just passed, right? Correct. So Director Hyen, how do you vote? Aye. Dr. Lepolpion? Aye. Dr. Goss? Aye. Dr. Kylo? Aye. Vice Chair Beto? Aye. Dr. Blasi? Aye. And I also vote aye. So the LGBTQ pride proclamation with amendment passes unanimously.
So thank you very much. All right, uh, our next item is um, appointment of a student advisor to the board. And uh, we have students online that have been here for um, a little bit. Um, and I know one of our students had a previous engagement tonight, so he has submitted um, his answer um, to the question um, in um, video format. So I think our uh, first one is uh, Grace Caldwell, a McKay High School student. I've also seen her playing tennis out there, Grace. Hello. And my, okay, my, my favorite Grace quote is, we need to have a class don't on adulting. Don't <laughs> on adulting. On a, no, I wouldn't ever be a bad quote, Grace. All right, Grace, it's all yours. You have a couple Okay, okay so, so my, my name is Grace Caldwell. I am a junior at McKay High School. Um, so I've worked on a couple projects for the district. I've done the SRO task force, the student engagement project, um, starting on the school discipline project. So I got to work with the NYU people who were here. And then this summer, I'm working with the Afrocentric summer enrichment program. So that will be really fun. Um, and then at McKay, um, I am a choir admin. So I kind of help with um, social media and doing fundraisers and merch. Um, I'm also a link leader, so I get to work, work with, uh, kind of act as a mentor for freshmen. I love working with freshmen. <laughs> I'm also NHS president. Um, I'm, I'm involved in the BSU at my school, so I got to do the Black History Month um, Salem Kaiser event, which is really cool. Um, and I'm also a two-sport varsity athlete. And then within Salem, as a community, um, I volunteer at the Humane Society as a camp counselor for elementary kids in the summer, which is really fun. Um, I'm also a student advisor to the on the Liberty House Board of Directors, which is a non nonprofit child abuse center. Um, and I'm working on the I Respect and Protect project, um, and we're trying to promote self worth and safe phone use. Um, and we're trying to kind of make a platform for middle to high school students so they can share their stories, either anonymous, excuse me, anonymously or with their name. Um, and then during the summer, I also intern at the Oregon Black Pioneers. So um, I we talk about Oregon Black history at museums um, or local um, historical societies. And we talk about conversations surrounding race in the workplace or in school settings. So that has been really fun. But I, I think that like regardless of the amount of projects I've taken on, I've noticed that they're all interconnected in one way or another. So during the SRO task force helped me um, approach school discipline and then talking about mental health with Liberty House helped me with student engagement. And then also just being a well-rounded person. So being a varsity athlete and then also doing choir and Scott Zappella. I mean, these are two very different groups of people but being exposed to different communities and learning about the struggles and the challenges within them. I kind of hope to mediate between being a member of the community and also a leader. So that's kind of my over, overall goal next year. <laughs> because I think it's fantastic. Oh, so I saw a TED talk, talk and the girl said, said multi-potential and I said, that's me, that's me. <laughs> own it, you say yes. Yep. I, I came up with that word because it's awesome. Yeah, I made it up. That was okay. me. <laughs> Another Grace quote right there. Yeah. I'm going to take it. All right. Thank you, Grace. All right. Uh, so the next, our next student is Dara from South Salem High School. She's also been very involved in a lot of our district work. So Dara, I'm going to let you take it away. That is me. Okay. Hello. My name is Oluwa Dara Alkena, but the only person who calls me that is my mom when I'm in trouble. I am a junior at South Salem High School. I, uh, I want to be completely authentic. This year, I had the opportunity to facilitate um, a couple of my school's staff meetings. And this is where I would interview students of color. But in reality, it was just a conversation with peers who have had similar experiences to me being a person of color. And it's really opened my eyes immensely. In addition, I got the chance to be involved with um, district committees such as Student Cafe, which all of my Student Cafe friends are here, and um, my school and the Equity Committee. And then um, I'm also in my school's DECA program, the Unified program, and I'm president of my school's Best Buddies program. And my school, South Salem High School, is the first school in Oregon to have this 
it's the first Oregon chapter. And this is just an organization for people with IDD. And um, in addition to that, I also became a teacher this summer and I get to become a teacher this summer in this Afrocentric program that Grace mentioned earlier. Oh, and this counts. I checked Wikipedia and technically I am president of my four younger siblings. Hold on, sorry about that. Changing locations. <laughs> no, it's my candle, but all is well. My room just likes to do that. Okay. <laughs> Before I was really interrupted, um, as much as I love being involved in as many committees and groups as possible, I know not to spread myself too thin. And I'm the type of person who will put all of my energy into things that I truly care about. And being a voice to many students who may feel underrepresented is one of them. I make it my priority to communicate, and not only to communicate, to comprehend with everyone that I can. I'm a people person, and due to my excessive talking abilities, um, I'm currently learning Spanish, French, ASL, Portuguese, and Yoruba, which is my Nigerian language. Due to my Nigerian background and an Oregon environment, um, due to my international student friends from the Ivory Coast, you speak fluent French, and the summers that I spend volunteering at camp a camp for special needs and nonverbal kids who communicate through American Sign Language, and my love for Bossa Nova, I'm constantly surrounded by beautiful culture and rich language. And I know that I can bring that multicultural experience to the board. Creo que es muy importante comunicarme con todas las personas en mi vida. Las buenas conexiones son muy beneficiosas. Me gustaría darle una voz a los estudiantes que no tienen las mismas oportunidades o conexiones. Gracias, obrigada, merci. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. Make sure your room's not on fire. That's right. Any other, anything for Dar before we go? Sorry. Yeah. This is going to be hard. Darla, you didn't say all these words last year. Last I know, round. I know, I'm you know, you're, Yeah. You're like a totally different person. <laughs> All right, our next uh, student is Paul from uh, North Salem High School. Hey, Paul, good to see um, you. I, I all, all four of these were, were last year as well. All right, Paul, take it away. Awesome, hi everyone, my name is Paul Quatch. I'm a junior at North Salem High School. Great to be back. Everyone's running again, which is super awesome to see. My girl Dara and Grace, awesome and awesome speeches, everyone. Um, here we go. Let's jump right into it. So, in terms of my school, I am the future Metro Vice President. I am also the MAFA Co President. I'll be going into the FBLA President position next year, which is the Future Business Leaders of America class. Um, I'm also in a program called Willamette Academy, which also just helps historically underrepresented students get to college. And me and my peers have created a sub program just last year, and I'm also the vice president of that program. I've also worked with my school on the AVID sites team meetings. And outside of that, I've also worked with a Metro club to present like um, things like Latino week, where we partnership with South Salem High School and did a week um, wide events. Um, on the district level, I worked with the student-led task force and SROs, the Reimagining School Discipline Community, um, the Student Advisory Community. Um, I also worked with the Oregon State Students United Summit Social Media Community. Um, the all, I attend all staff meetings with student voices, which is really cool to see at my school, and they continue to invite me back. I worked on the student engagement project. Um, I worked with Portland groups, so I've extended my work past Salem, which I've done work with Your Street, Your Voice, which is another program on design, and also environmental workshops on talking about community and trash and how we work around that. I've also, you see me last month with the Asian American Heritage Month, I posted a poem, I made the graphic design for all of you to look at, so that's really awesome. I also worked on um, different proclamations, like the one we just heard about and that has been just passed, which is super excited to hear about. And I attended various school board meetings. You see me a lot. I'm sure you guys recognize my face. And also I worked a lot with um, Chris Moore, which all of you probably know in the community. And I attend larger meetings as he sends them out to me and I report right back to him about these things. I'm also a Lita scholar and also an Alexander Hamilton scholar. And these are just activities I want to list out and bring to your attention because these are programs in which I got selected for. And I am able to manage this long list of activities on top of that, but I am willing to 
prioritize this. I've already set my schedule once again for the school board position. I think it's really important that I seize this opportunity and utilize every single aspect that we have. Being part of the 1% of Asian American students at North Sum High School, it's hard to continue to rise up when we're, we're trying to bring as many voices as we can, but we continue to see the same faces all the time and seeing like higher positions of school board and lacking that Asian American representation, it's really hard to have other groups feel like they have a voice or a sense of belonging if we don't have representation. And like, I wanna continue to push that. And this is my senior year, it's my last chance to make change and we need to do something. I've worked hard to get my voice heard. I've gained this new sense of confidence and it's just really important that I am able to do this. I've launched numerous projects. Um, talking about intersectionality is a huge piece that I bring to every single paper report um, event that I put on with my committees. And I have a lot of plans and I feel like we should just keep going. And the last thing I would just bring up is that I'm not afraid to speak up against adver adversity. And if something I don't agree with, I'll be very vocal about it. But once again, thank you for the opportunity and, and good luck to everyone running. Yeah, I had a question for you, and uh, I only remember part of it now because it was towards the beginning. Uh, Alita, what what is that? Yeah, yeah Alita, Alita is, is another, another program that I got into, Leadership Enterprise of a Diverse America, and it's just another um, leadership development college readiness, and it has like a 5% acceptance rate of like 100 students all across the nation. Yeah. All right, and our last student is Isaiah, and is Aaron or Emily going to put on the video from Isaiah? There's Isaiah. No, Isaiah? Sorry. This is what I would ask is, oh, you could hear me, I'm gonna do a mic check. But I'm not here for that, so here I am, to the form of recording. Oftentimes, we get asked to respond to a question by a teacher, and we would provide an answer, if we had one. If. And this time I do. I would bring student voice to the board by offering my honest, unfiltered thoughts and opinions about how the situation is going right now and how we can improve and grow from there. The student engagement product gave me a lot of insight into what's going on. It made me realize that originally, when I first came on here, I did not have one sliver of a clue, not even one sliver, about what's happening. What's happening, you may ask? What's happening is that there's not enough communication, there's not enough fluent and meaningful conversation going around needed to fuel the changes that need to be made. And I can fill that gap. I can get those conversations moving. Or I can sure as I'll try to. And yes, I know that was highly informal and I apologize for that, I really do. But I could not think of another way to say it that it had the same effect as that did. And finally, I wish the rest of you the best of luck and hopefully our chance are not decided by the flip of a coin this time. Here's a coin for reference. That was awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you want to find a way to keep all of them. I did um, email all four of them either last night or this morning, I can't remember which, um, to remind them that the student advisor for the State Board of Education position is open and they're accepting applications. And it'd be awesome if all four of them applied for that. I know that they will only take one as well. For a student? No, for the oh. both. Oh. <laughs> his answers. I know. He's All right. For so, whatever. yep. <laughs> this. All right. Do we get to see your faces again, or are you hiding behind your cameras now? Either way is great. Last time it was so awkward. It was. For all of yeah. Them. There we go. We want you to have this awkward moment again together. <laughs> I think that you have ballots. Do you? Yes. I'll, hopefully we, we have six of these and we hopefully will not have to use all of them and also use a coin this time. So I'll collect them and then tabulate them. So you just... Wait, what? You, we just have to mark one. You vote for yeah, one. You vote yeah. for one. Yep. Do you guys have the Jeopardy song? Can you, can you sing too? <laughs> there we go. All. We're ready. Come on. Open it.
I can keep track for you if you want to call them out. It didn't put um, name I have a, a sheet here. Okay. Um, <laughs> Director Hyen votes for uh, Grace Caldwell. Um, Director Lepold Pion votes for uh, Dara Elkana. Director Goss for Dara Elkana. Director Kylo for Paul Koch. Director Chandra Geary for Grace Caldwell. Uh, Director Bethel for Grace Caldwell. And Director Blossie for Grace, Grace Caldwell. And that is four votes, so Grace Caldwell has been elected. Congratulations. And can I respectfully request that on her name tag, it has the word multi-potentialist? Oh my God, <laughs> I I was there. I mean, the other candidates, I was like, I'm screwed. I am screwed. <laughs> Before, no, I heard speaking, speaking like, like five languages. languages. I said, you can cut me out right now. Cut me out. Paul runs every single thing. I said, cut me out. <laughs> Before you both, I mean, all three of you go back home, uh, you know, I would really like to see that there is some way if you can work with our board and kind of help us because we really want to find a way to kind of uh, get the, all the wisdom and potential from our students. So please, uh, I made this request last year, <laughs> uh, last batch, and we would like to do the same thing. Uh, so please, Paul and uh, Dara and Isaac, please be involved, be engaged. We have so much to learn from you all. So thank you very much, and congratulations, Grace. Yeah. All right, and you know we'll have plenty of leadership opportunities for you too, right? <laughs> okay, thank you so much for being here tonight. All right, are we ready to move on to the next yeah. item? She wants a break. Quick break. Okay, we'll take a five-minute five, five, okay, we'll five five break. <laughs> Sorry.
we're going to restart again. Yes, we have a quorum. All right, we do have a quorum. We'll start. So we'll go to the next item: adoption of resolution number two zero two zero two one dash four. Adoption of the and appropriation of twenty twenty one. Sorry, twenty one. 2021-22 budget, including resolution to close Loretta Isom Scholarship Fund, close small memorial fund, and resolution to impose and categorize taxes for the fiscal year 2021-22. Superintendent Perry. All right, this is um, the uh, resolution to adopt the budget and make the appropriations for the 2021 uh, school year, so um, I think you could entertain a motion. I move staff recommendation. I second the motion. So the motion was moved by uh, Director Blasi and seconded by Vice Chair Bettel. Any discussion? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing no discussion, are we ready to vote on this? You are. Okay. Yes. Director Blasi, how do you vote? Aye. Vice Chair Bettel. Aye. Uh, Director Kylo, no. no. Director Goss? Yeah, aye. Why, uh, Director uh, Lipol Pion? Aye. Director Hyen? No. And uh, uh, I vote aye. So how many? One, two, three? Five, two. Two Five, no's. two. And there are two no's, Director Hyen and Director Kylo. That's correct? Yes. Correct. So the motion passes. Uh, adopt resolution number 2021-5, resolution to utilize the 2019-20 May Adjustment State School Fund General Purpose Grant in fiscal year 2020-21. So Superintendent Perry? Oh, Dr. Yeah. Kyla Mose. It. I second. Okay, Vice Chair Bethel seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, how do we, let's, all those in favor vote. say aye. Let's vote. You say all those in favor say aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any, Any opposed? Vote. All right. Motion moved. It's ad, uh, it passes. Next. Uh, e, uh, determine and approve the May 18, 2021 special district elections results for four school board member seats. Superintendent Perry. Uh, in your uh, board packet are the election results that have been um, uh, provided to us and certified by Marion County Elections. Uh, your job is to um, approve them and Paul DeCopolis has uh, reviewed this and recommends um, approval of the results. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the recommendation. So Vice Chair Bethel moves the the recommendation and Director Kylo seconds it. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Anyone opposed? None. So the motion, uh, the resolution uh, determined to approve the May 18th special district election results for four school board candidates, uh, school board members. Okay. Seats passes. Consent calendar. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent calendar. All right, thank you. And anybody? Second. I'd and like Dr. to pull Kyla, second. Anybody? Well, I'd yes. like to pull uh, B, item B. Okay, you want to pull B separately, okay. So is that, uh, do we have to take, uh, anybody has to second that? No. No. Okay, any discussion? So oh. who moved that? Oh, for the, I did. And I seconded it. <laughs> Director Blasi Second. moved that, and Director Kylo seconded. And uh, any discussion? We continue to vote on all the seats. Okay. So can we <coughs> vote? And is that all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Any anybody opposed? None. So it's moved. Uh, so it passes. Now we're going to take the B separately. Approval of personal action items. 
Yeah, I have a question for the superintendent, and she, she may not know offhand, but uh, it seemed like there was a high number of resignations. Is that higher than normal for this time of year, or is that about average? Um, I think uh, John Bate would say it's about average, because we've had this question. Yeah, we looked at the, that information on a regular basis. Uh, it is maybe even a little bit below average, but probably trending by the time we get through summer hiring to be about average. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. So I move we uh, accept the uh, personnel action. Second. Second. So my Director Hyen moves and Director Kyler seconds. And any discussion? None. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? None. So it, so it passes approval of personal action items as presented. There's no readings. <coughs> uh, Superintendent Perry will go to the standard reports. Yeah, and I... I would like to make a suggestion. Okay. Please read the report and forward your questions by email mm -hmm. to Superintendent Perry, to Vice Chair Bethel and I, so that we can collect these questions and have a work session to do a further dig down, kind of unpack, and if necessary, like a root cause, and make sense out of it. Second thing is, this monthly reports of this data, just observe it, let's look for a trend rather than reacting to it and running with just one data point because then it's really hard. So with that, Superintendent Perry. So I'm just, I'm kind of confused. Do you want me to go through each report or just want me to? You're gonna share some all right, so um, just one uh, quick item under A on the graduation report. I just want to make note that um, under the South Salem, you have an updated board plate. Uh, it was on the slide, but we missed uh, Bailey Kohler as one of our valedictorians, so it's okay. updated on the board slide. Um, the B and C um, academic programs and legally required policies, you've had these um, in your board packet. And I don't think we've received any questions Monday regarding these reports. Okay. Um, and same with the monitoring um, data report. So I'm, is that how you wanted me to handle those? Yeah, okay. any qu questions, please uh, pull those questions so that uh, as Ms. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Cobb suggested, like we will have like a work session based on those questions. You remember that discussion we had? <coughs> In yeah, we can. one of the meetings that we talked mm -hmm. about having a work session when the new <coughs> directors come on board. Yeah. So That's based on these pooled questions on this. Yeah, if you have specific questions, I think you're specifically talking about the data report. Data report. Okay. Correct. So not all the reports, not the, all data the data reports. report. Is but if you have any questions on any reports, email us and um, I'll be sure to get the answers. Uh, Chair Shondaguri is specifically talking about the data report. If you had some specific questions that it might be good to get those, we can see what questions you have, especially as our outgoing board members um, that we could pull together as we designed um, potentially a work session if the new board uh, wants to do that. Thank you. Now, uh, with that, we'll move to item 11, board reports. And could I just do one more please, thing? Please, Sorry, um, just a just one announcement about board meeting schedule. Our first board meeting of 21-22 is July 13th. That is when we will swear in uh, new board members and we will choose uh, board yeah, leadership right. uh, for next week, year as well. So I just wanted to mark, have people mark the calendars. The rest of the board meetings, uh, business meetings and work sessions are in the agenda packet as well. And uh, once we get to the new um, fiscal year, the new school year, we'll send out calendar invites. Yeah, thank you very much. Now we'll go to the board reports. You know, four of our board directors will be leaving the board and we'll have four new board directors come in. So I'm going to, we have requested each of board directors to read a resolution recognizing the contribution of the outgoing board director. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, Director McDaniel, you have some gifts for them, right? Yeah. We'll start with Director Lepolpion reading a resolution 
for outgoing student advisor Lynette Webbent. <laughs> Be prepared. Go ahead. Go you ahead. don't get to read one, Hold Director it. Kylo. All right. <laughs> Hold your bag. Yeah. You can go ahead. Uh, well, first, I just want to say, Lynette, it's been an honor uh, getting to know you and serving together on board. Uh, I always look forward to sitting next to you <laughs> and, uh, you know, hearing your insights on, on things that we do. I think uh, you're invaluable. So, all right, here we go. Whereas... Whereas Lynette Mabinton, a McKay High School senior, has given faithful service as the student advisor to the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board for the 2020 2021 school year. And whereas student advisor Mabinton has a, was appointed by the board to serve as the first ever student advisor to the board, a newly created volunteer role. And whereas student advisor Mabinton served as a communications student intern beginning in 2019 using the SKPS Instagram platform as a social media tool to communicate and with and engage middle and high school Salem Kaiser students in district discussions and decisions. And whereas Student Advisor Mabinton served on the SKPS Student Equity Committee to ensure student voice in equity decisions, decisions, planning and implementation with a goal to create an anti-biased culture and a safe and welcoming environment for students, students of color. And whereas Student Advisor Mabinton served the superintendents on the superintendent's student task force to review the role of school resource officers in schools and advocated for change to show how SRO serve in schools. And whereas Student Advisor Mabinton has advocated for the student voice in district policy decisions using her own voice at a board meeting in 2019 while a sophomore at McKay High School speaking out about proposed boundary changes in the district and whereas Student Advisor Mabinton provided student voice and served diligently during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the Oregon ice storm and wildfires, unprecedented times that required the district to provide comprehensive distance learning online full-time and challenged us to provide care and connection for nearly 41,000 students and families. And whereas Student Advisor Mabinton has dedicated her life to advocating for youth voice and social justice, like during the national movement in 2020 that responded to the killing of George Floyd, an African-American male at the hands of police. And whereas Student Advisor Mabinton has dedicated her life, oh, I just said that one. <laughs> whereas Student Advisor Mabinton, whose grandmother has guided her on the value of taking a stand because the, the one time you don't speak up for yourself will always turn into another time and another time. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools recognizes, appreciates, and thanks Lynette Mabinton for her outstanding service to the district and her contribution of bringing student voice to the work of the board will be sorely missed. And be it further resolved that the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors extends its best wishes to Lynette Mabinton, resolved this 15th day of June, 2021. to ask the quest vice chair Bethel to read resolutions for outgoing directors uh, director Goss and director Kylo okay are you ready <laughs> <laughs> at board resolution acknowledging the faithful service of director Kathy Goss whereas director Kathy Goss has given faithful service as a member of the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors representing zone one for four years, beginning the 2017-18 school year. And whereas, Director Goss served as board chair during the 2018-19 school year. And whereas, Director Goss served as liaison member to the SKPS Community Outreach Committee for career and technical education for four years. 
And whereas Director Goss voted for the first student advisor to the SKPS school board to ensure student voice in board policy decisions. And whereas Director Goss helped provide budget oversight, which included the $619.7 million construction bond passed in May 2018, the third largest K-12 education bond in Oregon history at the time, which is now providing funds to relieve overcrowding, expand career and technical education, increase safety and security, including seismic safety, and maintain the community's investment in district facilities. And whereas Director Goss served diligently during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the Oregon ice storm and wildfires, unprecedented times that required our district to provide comprehensive distance learning online full time and challenge us to provide care and connection for nearly 41,000 students and families. And whereas Director Goss has dedicated her life to education, including serving as a teacher, counselor, principal, and school superintendent. She has been a fierce protector of the district, schools, leaders, and, it's, and is known for caring about individual students and their success. And whereas Director Goss has been a learner, she asked questions and carefully considered information, and this shaped her thinking and decisions. She diligently persisted in learning new technology throughout our ever-changing and ever-expanding <laughs> digital environment. <laughs> Yes, yeah, absolutely. And whereas Director Goss is known as a great person to disagree with, for her it is always about students, not her personal wishes. Even in disagreement, she would support the decisions of the board. And whereas Director Goss is present and devoted to doing whatever it is in the best interest of students, she spent countless hours walking and knocking on doors during the district's SK Schools campaign. <laughs> and whereas Director Goss has shown unwavering support for our district students and families, staff, community, and board member colleagues, bringing equity, insight, devotion, and firm resolve to all she does. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors recognizes, appreciates, and thanks Kathy Goss for her outstanding service to the district and her contribution to furthering the work of the board will be sorely missed. And be it further resolved that the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors extends its best wishes to Kathy Goss, resolved this 15th day of June 2021. I'm sure glad I didn't say that I fell down in the first porch when we rang doorbells up and down South Salem. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, and I apologize when I get testy, which happens now and then. But I, it's kind of a bittersweet li uh, leaving. I love kids, and I like everything about that, but we're off and around the world and going to do things we've wanted to do for a long time. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. And it, I wish it was a roast, but I didn't get to write it. But I would have totally roasted this guy. But you know what? I have Facebook, so we can take it there. <laughs> Board resolution acknowledging the faithful service of Director Paul Kylo. Whereas, Director Paul Kylo has given faithful service as a member of the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors, representing Zone 7, for eight years, from 2013 to 21. And whereas, Director Kylo served as Board Vice Chair in 2015 16 and 2016 17, as Board Chair in 2017 18, and as Budget Committee Chair in 2021. And whereas Director Kylo has served at the board's representative to the Salem-Kaiser Area Transportation Study Committee, otherwise known as SCATS, since 2013, and as the board's alternate member to the Council of Governments since 2015. And whereas Director Kylo voted for the first student advisor to the SKPS school board to ensure student voice and board policy decisions, and whereas Director Kylo helped manage oversight of the $619.7 million construction bond passed in May of 2018, the third largest K-12 education bond in Oregon history at the time, which is now providing funds to relieve overcrowding, 
expand career and technical education, increase safety and security, including seismic safety, and maintain the community's investment in districts, facilities, and whereas Director Kylo served diligently during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the organized storms and wildfires, unprecedented times that required our district to provide comprehensive distance learning online full-time and challenge us to provide care and connection for nearly 41,000 students and families. And before I continue, I just wanna say we're the only county in Oregon that had three presidential emergency <laughs> declarations in one year. Good job, you guys. And whereas Director Kylo is known for its strategic thinking, his knowledge of bargaining and advocacy for educators and his ability to determine how both sides can come together for the best interests of staff. And he is known for working with a variety of board members' perspectives, building consensus in times of opposing opinions. And whereas Director Kylo is ever present, whether at a farm to table event, fundraiser, school tour, student investment account committee, or international baccalaureate certification, when asked to help, Director Kylo always finds a way to be present and fill the need. And whereas Director Kylo has served as a culinary judge for our elementary students in the Food Services Future Chef's Annual Competition for many years. That's right. And whereas Director Kylo is known for his shirts, he wears a school mascot t-shirt or sweatshirt to match a board spotlight for his report or on recent activities. And whereas Director Kylo has shown unwavering support for, for our district's students and families, staff, community, and board member colleagues, bringing equity, insight, devotion, and firm resolve to all he does. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools recognizes, appreciates, and thanks Paul Kylo for his outstanding service to the district and his contribution to furthering the work of the board will be sorely missed. Be it further resolved that the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors extends its best wishes to Paul Kylo. Resolve this 15th day of June, 2021. Paul, I will take over the no voting for you. You would what? I'll take over the voting no for you. Okay. Oh, it's like a baton. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna miss you. No, you're not. I would, I would like to say one thing. Just one? Just one. I'll keep it short. I don't know who this guy is, but I know his name isn't on the SeaTech building. Because when they put the SeaTech plaque up, they forgot one name. Oh, what? How was that fixed? It's been fixed. Oh. But it was not there for a very long time. So it was like, okay. Well, hopefully but, they spelled it right when they got it on there. Uh, yeah, something like that. All right. <laughs> thank you. Oh. I'd also like to say, say thank you to that guy uh, because I was working at a, a gym in South Salem at one point in my life, and this guy would come in every single morning and complain to me about my, the quality of my towel folding <laughs> at 5 a.m., like right as we open every single day. And so every morning I would have to make sure my towels were folded just right. And, uh, you know, as I got to know this guy, he started talking to me about what he does on the school board. And, uh, uh, and then I kind of it, it introduced me to the idea. And so I uh, just want to say thank you, Paul, for, right, thank you. for that. And I hope your towels are forwarded nicely. Sure. Well, I, I'm going to ask Director Hine to read the resolution for outgoing Director Lepol Pion. But I just want to add a few more things. After this, we'll go around. You want to say a few words, but starting with, there are two community members, former board directors who are waiting. We'll start with them, and we'll go around, and that way we can say one or two kind words to each other. I'm going to do that. So Director Hines reads resolution for outgoing Director Lepol Pion. Uh, board resolution acknowledging the faithful service of Director Jesse Lepol Pion. Whereas Director Lapold Pion has given faithful service as a member of the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors representing Zone 5 for four years, beginning in the 2017 18 school year. And whereas Director Lapold Pion served as Vice Chair in the 2019 2020, and whereas Director Lapold Pion served as the board's representative to the Mid-Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance beginning in 2020 
and to the Salem Kaiser Education Foundation in the 2018-19. And whereas Director Lippold Pion served as on the OSBA Legislative Policy Committee in 2018 through 2020 on the OSBA Board of Directors for 2020-21, and as the Pacific Region Director on the National American Indian slash Alaskan Native Council of School Board Members, Board of Directors for the National School Boards Association in 2020 and 21, and Director Leopold Pion served as the Liaison Board Member to SKPS, Community Bond Oversight Committee, 2018 through 21, for the 619.7 million construction bond passed in May of 2018, the third largest K-12 education bond in Oregon history at the time, which is now providing funds to relieve overcrowding, expand career and technical education, increase safety and security, including seismic safety, and maintain the community's investment in the and district facilities, and whereas Director Lippold Pion advocated for and developed policy to facilitate the first student advisor to Salem Kaiser Public Schools School Board with the goal of ensuring student voice in board decisions, and whereas Director Lippold Pion served diligently during the COVID 19 global pandemic and the Oregon ice storm and wildfires unprecedented times that required our district to provide comprehensive distance learning online full-time and challenged us to provide care and connection for nearly 41,000 students and families. And whereas Director Lippold Pion is known as a committed learner, whether learning about governance to do his part in building a high-functioning board or asking operational or curriculum questions to support the district. He has been a personal learner, taking Spanish and listening along with district interpreters during board meetings. He was not listening to the game. He was actually listening to the, <laughs> to the meetings in Spanish. Uh, and listening along with the district interpreters during board meetings. And graduating from Willamette University while simultaneously serving as a board member when he made mistakes. He used them to learn and vowed to do better. And whereas, Director Lepold Pion is known for helping students however he can. He advocated for our students navigating homelessness, mentored a group of high school students, represented and supported our Native American students, and advocated for expansion of dual language learning programs. And whereas Director Lepold Pion has shown unwavering support for our district students and families, staff, community, and board members, member colleagues bringing equity, insight, and devotion and firm resolve to all he does. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Board of Directors of Salem Kaiser Public Schools recognizes, appreciates, and thanks Jesse Lepold Pion for his outstanding service to the district and his contribution to furthering the work of the board and will be sorely missed. And be it further resolved that the Salem Kaiser Public School Board of Directors extends its best wishes to Jesse Lepold Pion Resolved this 15th day of June, 2021. Uh, yeah, I would say, uh If I was to summarize my experience serving on the school board, I would summarize it with this quote by uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, do the best that you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Um, I got elected onto the Salem College School Board in 2017 as the youngest school board member in the state and the first and only Native American to ever serve on the Salem College School Board. Three years before you elected me, uh, I was homeless. And I mean, I, I never thought I would graduate high school, you know, uh, you know, let alone be here. So I'm grateful for everything. 
Um, I served on the, I served on this board fight for our most vulnerable kids. Uh, and that's what it's all about. You know, it's about the kids. You know, and as for my future, what I'm doing, uh, I made a promise to myself when I was a teenager while sleeping in a freezing elevator that I would try my best to be successful and then come back and save every kid who was falling through the cracks. Like, yeah. I, st I still intend to make good on that promise. I'm going to read the resolution for Dirk of Lassie. Thank you. Acknowledging the faithful service of Director Sharon Plassey. Whereas Director Sharon Plassey has given faithful service as a member of the Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors representing Zone 3 for four years from 2017 to 2021. And whereas Director Plassey served as a board vice chair during 2018-19 school year and whereas Director Blasi served as the board's representative to the Council of Governments in 2019-20 and in 2021 as board representative to Willamette Education Service Depart District in 2018-19 and to the Salem Kaiser Education Foundation in 2019-20 and Whereas Director Blasi voted for the first student advisor to Salem Kaiser Public School School Board to ensure student voice in board policy decisions. And whereas Director Blasi served diligently during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the organized storms, wildfires, unprecedented times that required our district to provide comprehensive district learning online full time and challenged us provide care and connection for nearly 41,000 students and families. And whereas Director Blasi helped provide budget oversight, which included 619.7 million construction bond passed in May of 2018, the third largest K-12 education bond in Oregon history at the time, which is now providing funds to relieve overcrowding expand career and technical education, increase safety and security, including seismic safety and maintain the community's investment in district facilities. And whereas Director Blasi is the eternal auditor, <laughs> asking <laughs> probing program financial <laughs> questions an auditor would true, ask. True. And whereas Director Blasi is known for a calm, thoughtful, pragmatic, and optimistic approach supporting the work of the district and our students. And whereas Director Blasi is known throughout the community for quietly building relationship on trust and learning, she's always willing to meet the community and support from a position of openness and genuine listening. And whereas Director Blasi has advocated for public input and voice into the board decision and emphasized the inclusion of historically underserved and minoritized persons in discussions on safe and welcoming schools and creating equitable solutions for all students to feel a sense of belonging. Whereas Director Blasi has shown unwavering support for our district students and families, staff, community, and board members, colleagues bringing equity, insight, devotion, and firm resolve to all she does. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Salem Kaiser Public Schools recognizes, appreciates, and thanks Sharon Blasi for her outstanding service to the district and her contribution to furthering the work of the district will be sorely missed. And be it further resolved <coughs> that Salem Kaiser Public Schools Board of Directors extends its best wishes to Sharon Blasi. Resolved this 15th day of June 2021. Did we miss that she was vice chair of the budget committee for two years? Did I, or did I just not hear that? Okay, we'll fix right. it. Got it. Please forgive me for all that was missed. 
and congratulate uh, Superintendent Pr Perry and uh, Director McDaniel. They did a good job of putting these things together. So forgive me. <laughs> forgive them if they have been some oversight. Each and every one of you have contributed far more than what that little list I want you to know. So I'm just going to go around and first we'll start with the community uh, uh, director, Nancy McMorris Addis. If you are still in the. <laughs> yeah, there she is. Thank, Thank you. Hi, I think Jim Green is going to go first. Mr. Jim Green. Will you please thank you. Sorry that we had to keep you waiting so long. Oh, that's no problem, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and Superintendent Perry. Um, I'm here to, to to praise a couple of the school board members that I got to serve with during my time on the school board. Uh, first is Jesse Lippold, and you all heard the story about Jesse, um, about his struggles in his personal life with regard to being homeless and not knowing whether he was gonna graduate high school, but I don't think a lot of people know exactly what he did during his time on the board. He was a full-time student at Willamette University, and I know that because he served in a class with my son. Um, he also held a job as a real estate broker in the area, and he volunteered countless hours as a mentor and a volunteer to students in this school district. And I remember when Jesse first got elected, I was like, well, who's this kid that got elected to the school board? And what I found out about this kid was he was very student-centered. If any decision that Jesse ever took, I knew he was gonna think about kids first. And you see that in his leadership in being the board member that brought the student voice to the Salem Kaiser School Board. So any student that gets to serve in that role should look to Jesse as their mentor and understand the sacrifices that Jesse made in his life and his time on the school board. In addition, you know, he's one of my bosses. He sits on the OSBA board of directors. So I have to say good things about him. But one thing I really learned about Jesse over the time was he was a learner. He made some mistakes early on and he learned from those and corrected actions and moved forward. And always, 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 Jesse put students first, and they were at the heart of his decisions. That's what school board service is about. So, Jesse, I know you wanted to continue to serve, but look at it this way, buddy. You get your Tuesday nights back now, and you also get to sit back and say, I got to serve on a school board that did really good work for over 40,000 students in the Salem-Kaiser School District. And every time you watch a school board meeting and you see that student at the panel, you get to say that was the work I did. Good job, Jesse. <clears throat> the other person I get to recognize is, uh, is Paul Kylo. Um, and I kind of agree with the vice chair. A roast would be in, in order here for Mr. Kylo, but Paul, you and I served together for six years on the Salem-Kaiser School Board, and I think you are the last school board member now sitting that was with me when we hired Christy. And I have to say, that was the year I was board chair, and Paul is all about governance and good votes, and I think the best vote he took was to be the sole no vote against me for board chair. So I always appreciated that about you, Paul. Um, but I do want to say that I leaned on Paul very, very hard that year as we were going through a superintendent search to find the person to lead our district after Sandy Husk left. And Paul and I um, did a lot of work together on that search. He supported the idea of going back out for another search um, after we didn't find the first candidate. And that's hard to do. And I've always appreciated Paul's support of me as board chair that year as we went through that search process and found Christy Perry. The other thing I'd mentioned, and he already mentioned it, um, was the fact that when we were touring the SeaTech building after it was built, and by the way, Paul was on the board, one of the votes in favor of creating SeaTech because he knew what it meant for kids. He knew what it meant for kids to build that center and have those programs for those kids. As we were walking around, we looked up outside the office and he goes, Jim, my name is not on there. And I happened to lean over to Christy at the time, and I said, Christy, Paul's name's not on there. But Chuck Lee's name was on there twice. So Paul 
now that you're on that plaque, you will be forever memorialized as someone who supported SeaTech. And finally, the last thing I'd say about Paul is, Paul, that amazing collection. You have of T-shirts and sweatshirts from across the district. I don't know where you got them all, but every time I would come into a board meeting, I'd go, okay, what's Kylo wearing today? Which school is he representing? And which one is he going to give a shout out to? Paul, your service on the board has been exemplary. I consider you a friend. The time that you spent going to all those committee meetings and all the things you did on behalf of this district are so appreciated. No one knows the countless hours that it takes to serve as a school board member, except for those of you that have done it. And Paul, you did it very well. Thank you, Dir uh, Director Jim Green. I really appreciate it. Director Nancy McMorris Addis, please. Chair, Chair Chandra Geary, Vice Chair Bethel, members of the board, I'm here tonight to acknowledge and applaud the service of Kathy and Sharon. To Kathy, I think I first got to know you on the bond campaign where you came out and walked neighborhoods. I'd forgotten that you tripped um, early in that, but um, you'll be glad to know I'd forgotten that. Um, you convince the business community of the benefits of the bond and you set records for lawn sign distribution on the board. You always seemed willing to learn your role. And as chair, you led with a strong understanding of what was board work and what was the administration's work. You seem to genuinely listen to the discussion at board meetings and center your votes on what was best for students. To Sharon, you have been a champion of the community as a whole. You have listened to the voices of students and families who have felt unwelcomed at times in our district and with your colleagues on the board. Your position has been incredibly lonely. And in the transition to virtual meetings, the community failed to show you our appreciation for your courage. For my part in that, I'm sorry. You should know that your work has been appreciated and applauded by many in the community. Your calm and thoughtful responses under duress were laudable. I'm truly sorry that your time on this board has been so difficult. I want you to know it has not been in vain that you have made a difference and your work is both recognized and appreciated. To all of you retiring after tonight, thank you for your service and enjoy your Tuesday evenings. I just want to kind of go around and see if you want to add a few words. Director Blasi, you want to say a few things? Just, just for <clears throat> goodness, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Thank you, Nancy, for those, those words. Um, I guess for me, man, what a, what an incredible four years, plus the you know the year to campaign and um, it's 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 been a ride that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but I've learned a lot and I appreciate the opportunity, and um, you know it's it's never supposed to be about uh, board members, individual board members. It's supposed to be about the students. And the district and supporting the district and asking you know the tough questions sometimes um, and this district is phenomenal um, and I know in my time on the board we've seen growth uh, I think our first group our first year uh, when Jim was with us and others you know we asked a lot of questions about um, transparency and a lot of a lot of conversations about equity uh, four years ago, and I so much appreciate the district's approach um, and Christy Perry for your leadership um, and in creating an incredible team. Um, although it's changed a little, <laughs> I, I can't imagine um, you know a, a better team that you've built and a couple of folks that we've had to say goodbye to and. Um, but my goodness, what you all have overcome in the last year and with grace and just with just resolve and 
uh, just phenomenal. And each one of you continues to grow. And I really, oh God, I wish I, I, I wish I were able to see you, you know, each week and how you grow. But you have incredible potential, and you're already fantastic. So, um, but each one of you and. Craig, my goodness, I've learned a lot about uh, just the education system from you and how to care for kids and, um, you know, just each one of you. And Mike, <laughs> I think <laughs> even before I got on the board, um, I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Mike and ask some <laughs> questions that I'm sure he was probably thinking, oh my goodness, what are, <laughs> what are we getting into? Those auditor but, questions. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, all of you, just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I would say for me personally, uh, <clears throat> um, just learning to find my voice. Um, I got an email from somebody a couple years ago, and I don't even remember who the person was, but they said, why don't you speak up in board meetings? Um, you ask great questions, but why don't you speak up? we elected you to speak up. And um, after a minute of being hurt and offended, <laughs> you know, I, I got over it and, um, and they were right. You know, that's, that's part of our role is to speak up. And so I think for me personally, for growth, the last four years is about finding my voice. Um, and there, there may have been a couple times where I, I may have found my voice a little too much, but, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate that nobody said anything about that, but, um, but, Not going the resolution. yeah, <laughs> that wasn't in the resolution, but, um, but thank you. Thank you all for the incredible opportunity. Good job. Thank you. Vice Chair Batchel, you have, please. Well, I think I, it's, it's really about them. And I, th I think Jim said it best. Nobody really has a single freaking clue how much time goes into being a school board member until you've been in this seat. And this whole board, but specifically the four of you, specifically Paul, I mean, seriously, the guy shows up to like every second of every commitment he's assigned to, and then he stays later. And he's, he's like the the staple in the paper. He's just there. <laughs> and you just wonder, how did he get there? And he just stays. You know, Paul, I watched you perform during the SIA process as our liaison popping in to, to only two of how many of our meetings there were. And you were just kind of the fly on the wall, the person leaning in the back. And I just, I really admire the steadfastness that you presented to the commitments that you made on behalf of this board and the reports and the support that you provided us when we would engage you. I think of all the board members that are leaving, you have the most experience when it comes to education and you will be sorely missed. Your ability to argue back and to press people for being better in their processes and thoughts is, is gonna be really missed because I think you genuinely truly care about the growth of each of us and the district as a whole. And Sharon, I love that they didn't bring up the things that we all don't want to like know about ourselves in our finest moments, but you recover really well. I think that the, I think you're right. Nancy's right. It's been a hard year or two, uh, but a really hard year. And you have showed up and you've, you've been calm through so much of it until you weren't. And it was just a second. And I would not have recovered the way that you did. And I respect the fact that this is emotional work for all of us. It is about the kids but we're here because of the kids. And your, your emotion and the depth of that is really important to the work that's been done and the work that's gonna be done. So thank you for that. And Jesse, you've done so much and you've grown so much. I have no doubt that you're not going anywhere. You might not be here on this side making a vote happen, but I um, have no reluctance to think that you're going to engage every member the seven whole going forward with thoughts and opinions and interactions and, and, all, and all the things that you're really great at doing, you've done it all along. You were very courageous in interacting with people that you knew disagreed with you, probably profoundly in certain times, but you committed to learn. And I admire that about you. You are young, but that doesn't matter. 
You bring a perspective that made a difference. It's not just that you were Native American, it's not just that you're homeless at one time. You, you matter, and everything that you presented to this board over the four years really, really mattered. So keep engaging, keep going on the tangents and bringing it right back to the point you were trying to make because people learn through that process. So thanks for what you did. And Kathy, you've been around forever. I don't know that you can actually go on vacation and not come back. I think you tell yourself that, but I firmly believe that you'll continue to be plugged in even if it is over from Thailand or wherever it is you're heading. Thank you for the service of all the years from the very minute that you became a teacher and the progress that you made over your career. You've made statewide impacts for education and for kids. You've made a difference in my life as a, as a local elected leader, in this role and the others. And I really admire the work that you've done and how you <laughs> remained consistent in holding us accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carlo, you also get to speak. <laughs> uh, anything other than no will be allowed today. <laughs> No. He's Dr. No. <laughs> I call him my Dr. No. <laughs> you are not allowed to use the word no. Come on, Director Kylo, say no one more time, please. I'm sure I will. Inadvertently, of course. <laughs> um, uh, it has been a privilege and an honor to have worked with all of you. I think you all are great and wonderful people. I admire you for your dedication and for your... Um, willingness to keep coming back every week <laughs> uh, which some weeks has been tougher than other weeks as we all know um, it's it's been a true privilege a true honor I can think of odd moments from each of you that I will not share You're allowed to share. I not in this particular <laughs> forum I don't think that's an a, probably appropriate and I could go to the administration as well most of them the only one exempt right now might be Olga, might be. The rest, I think, it's maybe Sylvia. The rest, all oh, I've got something on. Uh, you'll be receiving blackmail letters from me in the mail. <laughs> Just be prepared. I thought you were passing those on to me. Well, I might. I might, especially Craig. I want to thank Craig for reading all those, all those messages and, pro and presentations to me over the years. I'm sure I couldn't have gotten through them on my own. Eton has followed Craig's example. I appreciate that. You're better. You're better. <laughs> Mike Wolf, of course, thank you for all of your budget information and all the times that we have had to discuss numbers. Appreciate that. Um, John, uh, thank you for all of your leadership with uh, personnel issues that we've had to resolve here at times. And, of course, Mr. DeCopolis that I rarely agree with. Um, but then I do have a bias against lawyers, but that's, been, that's well known. That's not a secret. Everybody knows that. So, But I do want to thank everyone, um, and I want to publicly apologize. I know that Kathy at times felt I rolled my eyes when she was speaking to me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it again, I'm sure, by the way. Uh, that's just inadvertent watching the table. I want to uh, apologize to Jesse for picking on, on him for his, the towel folding. I do remember that well. Uh, I want to thank Marty for the uh, peanut butter treats, chocolate peanut butter treats that she would bring in every year. I still have one left. I'm celebrating tonight with the last one. So uh, I want to thank uh, Danielle for all of her efforts. They're appreciated, her support. And um, I, Sharon, I... I will remember and do remember our first actual visit. You, I don't know if you remember it, it was over a pizza. Vegetarian pizza after you had had a particularly grueling grilling, grueling grilling, by a certain group of educators. And we, we sat at Pietro's and ate pizza. And Sacha, good luck with all of your um, meetings and keeping track. And of course, Superintendent Perry, I would argue that you and I have not always agreed on things, nor seen eye to eye on many things, yet I do believe that the best vote I ever took was to uh, hire you in this district. Oh, so. Well, Nancy, first of all, thank you. 
thank you for all your nice words. And if I'm not mistaken, you came into my life before I ever thought of the school board. Nancy helped my daughter-in-law have my second grandson at the Silverton Hospital, and I didn't know we'd end up spending some time together after that, but that was pretty pretty wonderful experience. And I also have to thank each one of you. So I've been in education a long time in the past, and I appreciate things that you have done for me and said. Jesse, I remember when you called me early. No, it was late one night when we were, um, we were out campaigning and you said, well, I got everybody together. We're going to go do West Salem. Let's meet in the parking lot at South Salem. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I was the only one there. Jesse never <laughs> showed up. <laughs> 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 One of my finer memories, but we can get past that pretty well. And so, Sharon, I think as opposite ends of things as we sometimes are, I thought we managed to get along really well, and I was proud of both of us. Yeah. So that was a good year. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I Danielle, I wish you all the luck in the world with Marion County. And I know you'll be figuring things out. I'll be calling. <laughs> <laughs> and Satya, you've been a, a real asset to the board. And talk about a different perspective and all the research you've done and the time you've spent thinking about what's the right way to go is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And it is appreciated. Thank you. And Paul, I was getting along better on this board till I got moved down here by you, and I find myself maybe taking on some of the traits I should. I haven't rolled my eyes yet, though. But, uh, some other things have kind of transferred. Director Goss, we can have another board meeting till the June 30th if you want. Oh, no. Okay. No. no. <laughs> But thanks all of you, and Christy does have a, just a spectacular team behind her. And Craig, I wish you all the luck in the world entering a new district and new activities and new thoughts. Ethan, you're doing a great job. I still think you're a good looking guy on TV. <laughs> but <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'd better start there. You're right, Paul. I'll shut up now. But it has been, this last year has been tough, real tough on everybody. And I think we all held up. There were ups and downs, an awful lot of downs. But we had some good times, too. And thank you. I'll miss all of you. Director of the poll, do you want to say a few words? Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, I'll say a few things. Uh, most of my things are, I, I wrote each of you a letter. Actually, I took a lot of time on this just because I think that what I can say in a few seconds can't be, sure. uh, you know, <laughs> can't really amount to the impact that you've had, uh, that we've had together on the district as well as, you know, uh, your impact on me. Uh, but just really quickly, uh, Marty, uh, you know, I remember when I first got on the board, you were <laughs> my campaign mom. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I've really liked getting to know you um, over the past over the past four years, and uh, I've seen that. Um, and when also I'm, I'm friends with your son, we played Fortnite together not too long ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's been really cool seeing you grow as well. And uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been it's it seems like it was just yesterday we're <laughs> we're on the campaign trail. So I mean, it's <laughs> it's been good to getting to know you and, and serve together with you, uh, Lynette. You're my favorite person on this board, and I'm not sorry for saying that. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I've loved getting to know you. I think you're bright. I think uh, you're the future of our community. And after you go to Arizona, I'm going to talk you into coming back. <laughs> oh, I'll do it. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much for, for your service as well.
I think that uh, you're awesome. Uh, for myself, hi, Kathy. <laughs> uh, what's really funny about Kathy is when we were first campaigning <laughs> together, uh, which, by the way, okay, on South Salem, I just told you the wrong time on accident, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but we did have people meet <laughs> at the school. Uh, but a lot of times, me and Kathy, what's really funny is uh, well, there's a – every now and then we would disagree on stuff, but, like, it wouldn't be anything big. A lot of times it would just be, like, the way, like, we say things. <laughs> and so I always, I've always appreciated talking to Kathy uh, just because of, uh, I don't know, I guess our generational gap. <laughs> we think of things a little differently. And uh, I've always loved our conversations. And your insights as an educator and as a super, past superintendent, I think, is – uh, a huge asset that this board has had, so thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, I've, I've already shared a folding tower story. <laughs> but, you know, throughout the board, you know, as things go on, uh, like if I want to know how the system works or if I have questions about paperwork or the insights of, uh, like, actual documents, like Paul's the person I call. <laughs> and so uh, thank you, Paul, for your service. Uh, Satya, um, I think of you as a friend of mine. I remember we first met, Satya and I did, on a board for Salem Health. Uh, and this this was a thing about uh, mental health awareness for kids. We're talking about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and it was really cool because we got to play off of each other really well. I was sharing as a child, as someone who overcame a lot of ACEs in order to, uh, you know, uh, overcome those. And Satya was sharing as a um, as a psychiatrist and like as a professional what he did to help people overcome those. And so it was a really cool experience. And um, I've really been thankful getting to know you. Uh, and yeah, you're an amazing person. Christy, uh, I, I can't say enough. I mean, I think that uh, you're, a phenom you're an amazing person. I think you're a great leader. I would say you're easily one of the best in our community. Um, and I would just ask you not to give up. I know that this last year is, uh, it's been really hard. And I know it has, it has been for all of us. Um, but I've seen the work that you do and I, I know for a fact I could tell you without a doubt that you care about kids, you know, um, and I've, I've seen it, you know, in the, in the way when, when you and I were going to go read books together, you know, to kids, to um, these board meetings that go until midnight, what we look at, 930? <laughs> and so uh, just thank you so much. Thank you so much for your commitment to kids and to your dedication to our community. Uh, don't give up on us. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Christy, and, you know, you'll get the rest in the letter. <laughs> uh, Danielle? Um, I really appreciate your, um, your passion and your ability to get things done. <laughs> uh, from even when, before we were on the board, I remember I met you for the McKay football field, and you did a great job, and you've been a leader in, our, in the Kaiser community and in our community as a whole for a long time, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I think a lot of times you and I agree on the end goal. Sometimes we butt heads on how to get things done. <laughs> uh, but either way, you know, I think that um, I really appreciate your work on the board and uh, what you do for our community. I think you do a lot. And then Sharon, uh, you know, what's funny is, you know, w when we were both campaigning, uh, when we first started, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. But I think over the past four years, um, we've, uh, it's been really cool getting to know you. I mean, we've, I think we've gotten a lot closer over the past four years. And um, I've really appreciated your, your voice on the board as well as your, um, your ability to listen. <laughs> I think that's that's a really important asset. And, uh, thank you for your service. And then the, I won't go too long because we only have so much time. But I'll, sure. I'll I'll bring you guys letters and I'll get them to you. But it was it's been a great honor serving with you guys. Thanks. Uh, advice from Mabinton, You want to say a few words? Um, I'll start with the team. Sylvia, it has been an honor knowing you. Um, we were a part of your hiring process, and I will never regret the decision of you being the one. And shout out to Lillian, because she was my first boss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she gave me my internship at the school district, and that was the beginning to a whole bunch of things. And I will be forever grateful for that. And um, to Miss Perry's assistant, um, Thank you for always being there, Alice, when, when we need you. Any questions, you have an answer, so thank you. Director Wolf, when I first met you, <laughs> we, are, we know. <laughs> we but you will always be Wolf to me, and you will forever have my respect. 
Um, Dr. Sproles, you will be a great superintendent. You really care about kids and it doesn't go unnoticed. And I wish you the best in your future. Um, the new assistant superintendent, is it Olga? I don't, yes. Okay, congratulations. Um, you're gonna be great for this position, so yes. Eat on. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot, <laughs> but it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you for guiding us and the task force and just being there and being different. You bring a different type of swag to use and it's very relatable, so thank you. Um, Director Blassie, um, you are genuinely a great person. Um, there was never a day, even when I was a freshman, coming to speak to you guys, um, I always felt like you were about the kids and I, till this day, I still feel that you are. You are genuinely honest and you are yourself, so thank you for, for doing that. It didn't go unnoticed and I always felt heard when I was speaking, so thank you. Um, Danielle, I know that you will, you will always speak up for what is right, <laughs> for Kaiser especially. <laughs> I will never have to worry about Kaiser because I know you're there. <laughs> I know you're there and I know you have Marion County too, so that's pretty big. And um, Superintendent Perry, um, thank you for everything these four years. Um, there was places where I was down and you were always checking up and I really appreciate that. And I don't feel like I would have came this far and where I'm at today without having your support. And as a leader and me being in so many leader positions, you were always there to give advice. And you always pushed me to be myself and to be honest and to never back down. And I will always appreciate that too from you. And thank you, thank you so much. I, I don't even have the words to explain how much I appreciate you. Um, Chair Shonda Geary, thank you for when I became student advisor. You always made sure I was up to date. Never missed an email, phone call, or anything, and that is very appreciated. And you were the one that was like, we need to make sure Lynette's set for this position, so I appreciate that. And Paul Kylo. <laughs> 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 we, we didn't exchange very much words <laughs> during my position here, but thank you for your service and years of being here and that doesn't go unnoticed and you're a hard worker and that showed so much you know being on this board and and you know a lot of the times you said no i i probably did agree with you because you are pretty honest so <laughs> Pro most of the time yeah, but they're, okay, okay. they're not right. on the time of being on the board a lot of times you said no i probably disagreed but before you do make very valid points and you could never go wrong with ag not agreeing with Paul. So <laughs> he's the lawyer, so he knows all the legal things. And Miss Goss, you are you're you're exceptional, and you're a powerful woman because you have the most years of service, and that doesn't go unnoticed. And you were always very kind. And when a lot of things were happening, you <laughs> still sent a message saying, "Is anyone checking on Lynette?" And that doesn't go unnoticed and you have this grandmotherly love and thank you so much and your outfit was very cute today so that's the way to exit <laughs> thank you very much. um director lipold um thank you for always being my partner <laughs> sitting right here right beside me and always talking and making board meetings you know just a little more fun and also thank you for everything else um over the four years we've had a lot of different things that we just came in contact about and just thank you for being young and relatable and understanding. So keep doing you and thank you for coming up with this position because I think his name is Jim Green. Am I correct? Like you said, it wouldn't have been here if you didn't bring it up in the first place. So thank you for that. And I'm forever grateful um, to Director Hine. Thank you too. Thank you for asking those hard questions and just doing your job in general. Um, and to everyone, thank you. Um, I know everyone's saying it's an honor to know me and me to be in this position, but it was an honor for me to be here and to speak on behalf of students. Um, and thank you to Grace and Paul and Dara and other students who have uplifted me during this time. And even before, um, this experience was a learning experience and it was so great. And everyone here has pushed me to be a better person and to continue to what I'm doing. So thank you for all the support and 
I will never forget this. I get to say I was the first student advisor and the first African-American one at that. So thank you. Uh, yeah, how does anybody follow all that? Um, you know, each one of you brought a unique uh, strengths to the board and this, this boardroom will just not be the same uh, without you guys in it and you will all be missed. Um, especially Mr. Snippy. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> I remember the first time I met Mr. Snippy, it was in a work session for CTEC, and I was running for the board. And uh, Paul was ornery, and he was really ornery. And there was just something about him, his orneriness. It's like, I like that guy. <laughs> So uh, it, I am honored to take over the no votes uh, for the, the next two years. Um, you know, this has been a really nice time uh, honoring and reflecting on our um, board members and, and our student advisor. Um, I wanna just take a moment to look to the future for a moment, uh, if that's okay, since it's gonna be over a month since we're together again. And uh, we're responsible for the safety and well-being of our students <laughs> while they're in our schools. And I would really, I'm asking the district uh, to, I would really like to have a work session that uh, details the steps, plans, re and resources they have in place to ensure the safety of our students if an earthquake were to happen while they're in school. I've heard a lot of concerns from the community uh, about this, and of course, you know me, I've always been uh, worried about the big one and when it would happen. Um, I, I would also like to uh, invite, ask the district to invite the Salem Emergency Manager to come in and see what we're doing and uh, have him provide insight uh, as to what we can expect afterwards and see if there's additional things we need to do to keep our students safe. And since September is Disaster Preparedness Month. I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that at that time. Of course, I know we'll probably have different leadership. So um, anyway, that's my request. And then another thing which is a little more difficult, um, you know, we got uh, one piece of testimony tonight uh, from a parent about critical race theory, and I'm sure you've all heard of critical race theory. A number of state legislatures across the country have made it illegal to teach critical race theory in their K-12 schools, and at least four have expanded this ban to colleges. In other states, parents, including minorities, have come to school boards to demand that they no longer include these teachings in their curriculum. And I don't know this is true, but I'm hearing from various sources that uh, these ideologies have infiltrated our schools here in Sam Kaiser. And I just want parents to be aware that whatever their feelings on the subject, whether for it or against it, that you know we're here to work for you. Please let your voices be known on, on what you want. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm just going to keep it brief. But I want to say thank you, Dr. Sproles. Uh, you know, and uh, it is uh, an amazing experience having your wisdom, sharing with us, teaching us, and the process, I grew quite a lot. You know, I, you know, I don't want to go into each and e everybody's name, which all of you have said so beautifully. For me, this was a wonderful opportunity. On June 30th, my term as chair will end. And so, <laughs> I call myself an accidental chair. <laughs> I didn't know that I had the skill set. I don't know if I did right or wrong, but we kind of, all of us pulled together. We did our foot patrol together. None of us bailed out. None of us came back in a body bag. We all showed up. Sorry, some of the meetings have been like six hours, seven hours, and endless hours in between. But, you know, you're all amazing people. You know, the circumstances, back-to-back -back disasters, you know, play tricks in our brain. We kind of moved to one camp or the other camp, but at the end of the day, this amazing people. And for me, this is the greatest blessing in my entire life. Little did I know. Now, growing up in India with a fifth grade 
I then took my 10th grade exam with a kerosene a hurricane lamp and studied there and kind of rode my bicycle to school for me to sit in this position. The trust you had in putting me here during the worst time in our nation's history, and you took a chance with me. It's, you know, I don't know how I did it, what I did. I really admire uh, Vice Chair Bethel for being the solid pillar and post. I mean, you know, any time in Superintendent Perry, you at various odd times at 5.36 in the morning, and now you've been exchanging endless hours behind the scene. But you're all beautiful people, you're a wonderful team, you're kind people. But, you know, as much as we all endured so much of suffering, but there's also wisdom in the suffering. There's some beautiful lessons I learned. The role of compassion, not to lose compassion just because somebody is suffering and angry and loud, or someone else is suffering and scared and hiding. Both are suffering. And how, as leaders, we can really learn to pivot from being from advocacy to policy, or from just looking for relief to cure. Sometimes cure can be painful, but those are the steps of implementation that is needed. So I think these are some important lessons we learn together. You know, moving forward, I really think our community has to work on one important goal. We need to come together, we need to heal. This, can, this paradigm cannot continue. You know, we can bring harmony in our community, like what we did by working internally, working on our own biases, working on things. It's like cleaning up your windscreen so that we can look with clarity that it's all about students. It's all about making sure social mobility for our children. I come as an immigrant. There's only one thing we look for. Our children should do better. They should be safe. They should do better than what we are. Nothing more. Otherwise, why would I leave and come here? And so I shared with all of you a little photograph of people going up. I don't know if some of you didn't get, so I'll get some more copies. That's the photograph I snapped in Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. It's a little statue, so I took the photograph. That is my idea of social mobility. That's what our public school systems can do and should do. If the ladder is not directed towards the sky, then we have to really question ourselves. Anything else what we do, is it leading up to that? I know we will all come together. We have to come together. Leaders have to transform the pain, suffering, fear, and kind of bring some healing in our community. We can do much better. I made a small list of 22 different things, and I sent it to Superintendent Perry. Despite all the tempest, we did that. Lynette is a testimony. Right? She mentioned that she's the first black uh, student, an African-American student, to be in that position. On a march, banks. You have two superintendents, persons of color and bilingual, bicultural. We have now four new board members. We have to welcome them. I don't want them to just feel included. I want them to feel truly belong, because I don't want them to just do well. I want them to excel, because then now it will translate into better outcomes for our children. I think that is my hope and vision, and we are going to work together. Superintendent and I are going to meet the four new directors elects. We'll do a brief orientation. We'll proceed with, uh, in some time in August, a retreat. And let's all work together. I ask our community leaders, please help our co different communities to pivot from whatever is hurting them to sit down and work on solid policies which leads to meaningful outcome. If it doesn't lead to outcome, it is not equity. It is just we are kind of circling the wagon. It has to lead to meaningful outcome, whether it is safety, closing the academic achievement gap, social mobility upwards. You can, we can agree on some outcomes. That way, we can connect with all communities. All the 90 communities will agree on those kind of outcomes. So let's work together. We have the historic opportunity where the new board will look or resemble the demographics of this community. We have a minority-majority composition. We have so much of diversity in leadership. And we have no excuse why we cannot reach that anymore. And with that, I want to thank you for putting up with me.
Mr. Dakopoulos said he has never worked so hard in his entire career. Like, <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Dakopoulos, for often not listening to what you said, yet getting through this. So go ahead, uh, Miss. I have one more thing for the future board and the ones that will be remaining. Um, please, please, always listen to students. Yeah. Thank you. I can't say this enough. Yeah. And also, please always do what's right because you can never go wrong with doing what's right. All right. So with that, the meeting is adjourned. Go home, be safe.